there's something beautiful about raw nature. It existed before you did, and it'll exist after you're gone. It's wide, open space with all the vastness of galactic clusters and long dead stars that still shine, and it's tangled closeness, rife with fractically expansive life of every sort that grows into and upon itself with ravenous earnest. As I descended from the crest of a rough high hill clear of trees where one half of that spirit was evident, and then pushed my way through the brush and tangle below where the other half ruled, I wondered at the ability of nature to still exist here. With all the cities, humanity has carved into the earth, with all the billions of us walking and driving and flying about, how could whole mountain ranges still sit out here largely untouched? Ongoing patter dripped slowly around me. Not rain, but a long-awaited melting above, below, and all around. Endemic white trails still clung to every bowl and shadow, awaiting higher angles from the sun. I felt at one with that anticipation. The month I'd just endured out in the wilderness had been spent trudging through snow, fighting biting breezy chills and the surging heat of exertion, and generally filling myself with calm acceptance to avoid shivering. The sun would be a very welcome sight and sensation, once it emerged from behind the gray clouds, and once I emerged from the oppressive maze of the Appalachian Evergreens. Even as I worked my way down steep inclines, I began counting more deciduous oaks and less coniferous trees. It wouldn't be long. Northwest, ever northwest. Somewhere ahead, flat land, and then a river, and then more walking, and then people. The very thoughts of returning to society suddenly reminded me that I had an appearance. I felt my rough face. I had a beard. A month wasn't so long that I should have looked like a bedraggled nightmare, but I could feel the gears of antrified social mechanisms turning slowly to action in my head. How should I behave? What should I say if I see someone? How do I explain where I've been for a month to people in my life? I could never show them the hard-won contents of my pack. I possibly couldn't even hint at what I'd been doing either. Who would believe that a suburban author from Ohio can simply head out into the wilderness one day without any skills and survive four entire weeks alone? Each day had been a terrible endeavor, and I'd never chosen to take such a journey, but I hadn't really had a choice. On the other hand, I didn't really regret it. I felt more in tune with my body and existence than ever before. The air was warming and full of energy, and I was alive. It took the better part of the day to reach a road. By then, the sky was a blazing sea of drifting orange, and I was vitally tired. I sat on the curb for a time, and no cars passed. But that was not unusual for some backwoods road in northwestern West Virginia, or wherever I was. The oncoming night brought a returning chill that refroze the wet ground. I resented the cold, but... It did make the walking easier. Rather than slog through muck, I moved quickly across frozen earth, following the road. All I needed to do was find a building, any building, really. Charge my phone. After that, a single power button press would hook me back up into civilization. Gloom set in, replacing fiery orange with fuzzy blue, which itself faded ever so slowly into impenetrable black. Still, I walked. I dwelled on my excuses. It had been a camping trip. People went camping sometimes, right? They didn't need to know the details or the gear I had or hadn't brought, and no, I hadn't had Wi-Fi out there to answer my emails. The ground changed underneath my shoes, and the wind began slicing perpendicular to me. I'd come to a larger road. No lights shined in either direction, and no cars passed as I decided which direction I should take. After a half hour of stumbling progress, I realized that I was stuck for the night. The absolute lack of passing cars hadn't escaped me, but it was too early to begin wildly speculating just yet. 
After four weeks in rugged forest, the road's edge felt like a luxurious hotel. I sat a few feet into the brush, hopefully close enough to be welcomed by a passing car, and far enough in to be avoid being seen. The cloudy sky hid the stars and kept me blind, but the darkness didn't bother me. There were terrible things out in the night sometimes, sure, but the open sky and night forest felt empty, calm. This was not one of those places where horrible fates lurked. This was simply nowhere important. I awoke to a burgeoning gray light, and I knew somehow that no cars had passed in the night. The mind never truly relaxes when one is alone and exposed. A half-present sleeping awareness remains, and had remained for me. I was less rested than I might have been otherwise, but I felt safer for the subtle drain behind my eyes. It was also time to start speculating. Walking along the road in a drifting ocean of swirling dawn light, I began keeping a more active eye out for cars. Like the tide pulling in and out, each passing hour brought a slight sharpening to the heavy hole underneath my heart. Something was wrong, and not in the usual way. Having left society's net so abruptly and for so long, had I simply lost the connection entirely? Had everyone else always just been a dream? I shook my head and soldiered on. Warm hope welled up around my heart as I sighted at long last a gas station. I sat at a gravelly corner in the country road, quietly soaking up near noon spring rays. Worries dispelled, I marched right up to the decrepit once white building, readying social phrases. The door opened easily and a bell chirruped above me as I swept in. There's something about an unused building that immediately strikes one as death-like and wrong. That something surrounded me instantly. Outside it was nearly noon and brightening, and here it was dingy, quiet. The lights were off, if such a lonely gas station even had any and there was nobody at the register. The shelves sat undisturbed. They were stock and free of dust from what I could tell. No sign of where the clerk might have gone. Was the station closed today and someone had forgotten to lock it? Or had the clerk gone out for a smoke? A subtle staleness in the air hinted that the abandonment had been longer than a few simple minutes. Others might have called out. Others might have shouted. I remained quiet, instead moving through the dim store with wary eyes. I found no threat, no sign of struggle. I found an outlet and got my phone out of my backpack, taking care to avoid the carefully packaged contents at the bottom. Taking the cord out, I put one end in the outlet here was the true test of the dread eroding the hope beneath my heart. If the electricity worked, then that meant my phone lit up. The electricity was working. I shook my head and laughed quietly to myself. I'd been out in the woods too long. Of course the world was still here. Civilization had carried on for 10,000 years without me. It certainly wouldn't disappear during the scant month that I'd opted out. Around. No signal. Of course. It would have been too easy to simply have my phone work, right? No, we're going to put me through the gauntlet here. A curious screeching noise echoed outside like a car engine straining against waking cold and I leapt up. Nope. I paused and grabbed my phone and charger. Not a chance in hell I was leaving my lifeline unattended in this abandoned station. A moment later, I burst out into the noon sunlight. But if a car had been passing, it was long gone. I ran across gravel until I reached the edge of the road and looked in both directions. Nothing. Memories of myself as a child resurfaced, unbidden. 
I stood and waited for the school bus on a gravelly curb just like this one many years ago. Life had been much different then. Simpler, in a way. Less technologically bound, for sure. I suddenly felt like an idiot. Outside my narrow daily life experiences, landline phones still existed. Sighing, I headed back into the station and found a phone by the register. It had a dial tone, though I wasn't sure what I'd expected. Weren't landline phones reliable? Wouldn't they work even if the power grid went down? I wasn't sure. Why did I know so little about such a long-standing technology? I frowned and tried to recall phone numbers for anyone I knew. I didn't know phone numbers either. There simply hadn't been a need to remember. I did know my own, though. Just to make sure, I dialed it. Without a signal on my end, my cell phone didn't ring, but I did get my voicemail. So the phone still worked. I called a number I thought might have been a friend of mine's, but got no answer, and the voice sale had no personalized message. Couldn't be sure it was the right line. Okay, what else? The operator. Was that still a thing? How did I dial an operator? I reached for my cell phone to look it up, then groaned. Had to be something simple, like... Right? I hit zero phone began ringing. I waited, expectant, until that space underneath my heart began sinking again. I gave it twenty rings, and then hung up. There was no operator. Time to get serious, I realized. My thoughts began pulling at information as I started doing what I did best. Thinking. There was no car parked outside the gas station. I should have known immediately that there'd be nobody inside. The lack of an operator could just mean that this station didn't have proper landline support. I didn't know enough about how landlines worked to be certain. The shells were stocked. I went through them, checking expiration dates. The food was older than it would have been in a functional store. Some expiration dates had passed, others had not. I looked up, but saw no security cameras. Taking as many bottles of water as I could and some peanut butter, I left a 20 at the empty register. Okay, time to hit the road again. I needed more data. Back in the noon light and warming breezes, I began walking and thinking. How many times had I watched this situation in a television show? How many times has I read stories about it? This was a classic case of confusing information and possibly missing people. What had those situations turned out to be? I came to a crossroads and stopped. The crossing road seemed wider and more traveled on than the one I'd been walking down. More often than not, and likely this was the best of bad options, something was wrong with me, not the world. Everyone was still out there, and I was simply having perceptual issues, delusions, or worse. If that was the case, then I jumped back from the crossroads. If I wasn't in my right mind, then cars could be passing all the time. There could be cars rolling by even now, and... I just wasn't aware of them for some reason. If I couldn't trust my perceptions, I couldn't cross the street. If something was wrong with me, I'd step out onto the road thinking I was the only man out there and I'd get blindsided by a speeding car. My pulse began racing as the gears of my logic started to grind. I stared up and down the long country highway. My perceptions were flawed. Was I supposed to see to cue myself in? The mind believes what the brain perceives. If I thought I was looking at an empty road, then no amount of staring or concentration would compromise that evaluation. Hell, there could be people stopped right now asking a crazy guy standing at the side of the road if he was alright. But 
and all I heard was the wind, now colored with an imagined desolate sigh. I couldn't cross the street, any street, and what if there had been a clerk back at that gas station who had been back out for a smoke and I'd just been oblivious? My head did hurt a little bit. I chalked it up to the poor diet and travel fatigue. What had I been doing out in the woods this last month? I knew what I thought I'd been doing, but objectively the idea did sound ridiculous. I only trusted it because I trusted myself and the experiences I had. If I couldn't trust those, how do I even know it was me? I guess some things you have to take for granted. Bending down, I grabbed a dirty white shirt out of my backpack. I had a marker, too, in a side pocket. I hadn't brought it on purpose, but there it had been the entire last month. And now I had a use for it. I quickly wrote out some words on my impromptu shirt-based sign, and I held it up. I'm blind. Crossing the street, 30 seconds. Help. Staring out at the crossroads, I held the shirt up at each stop sign, in turn, my eyes wide. I saw nothing. No cars, no drivers. I heard nothing. No engines, no confused shouts, but how could I know for sure? I couldn't stay here forever. I had to keep going. 28, 29, 30. Holding up the shirt like a desperate flag of surrender, I edged out onto the pavement, body steeled against the invisible impact at any moment. Unable to even breathe, I inched across the country road, heart rate spiking as I crossed each faded painted line. Heady and feeling on the verge of passing out, I leapt the last two feet and tumbled to the gravel on the other side. Was anyone watching me? Had I looked insane? Ridiculous? Were they going to try and help me? I waited, but felt no unseen hands on my arms and heard no distant concerned questions. I had to believe that I was alone. Standing slowly, I tucked the shirt sign into my pocket and started walking again, not at all comforted. As the afternoon wore on, I debated my personal facts in an endless and painful cycle. Objectively, I had all the behaviors of a mentally ill homeless man. How did I know that wasn't true? No. I liked who I was. But it wasn't that one way people stay trapped in mental illness. Their assumed beliefs were preferable to reality. That internal discussion fell away as I found myself walking up an on-ramp to Route 79. I actually knew where this highway was. It ran parallel to the mountains at some distance. I'd actually driven on it to get close to where I needed to go. If I could find a mile marker, I'd know where my car was. And... This highway, too, was empty. I almost couldn't handle the feeling of walking down a major highway without seeing a single car. I was darkly confident I would never forget those first few hours. Each passing moment lent weight to the insane idea that I was somehow the last man left alive. It was then that I began delving into darker thoughts. If I was the last man alive, where were the bodies? It was easy to think the rest of the world had died, but that would have necessitated disease, rot, devastation on a scale that was unavoidable by someone on foot like myself. I had to know something first. I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and stepped out onto the highway. I counted to 30, my heart beating three times for each second. This was probably the end, I knew. Except, I remained. 
Only wide breezes slammed into me. Only warm sunshine shot across me. Jesus Christ. It wasn't me. It was the world. Or at least this region of it. And still, the surrounding terrain felt calm and empty, free of threat. If the human race had died or disappeared, what had caused it? I should have felt something, but there was no lurking evil presence, no great air of sorrow, no dark misery on the wind. As I began the long walk toward where I left my car, I had time to consider new worrying questions. Science fiction and horror had often been obsessed with the end of the world for many decades. I'd read about this a hundred times. So what would I do now? More often than not, the manner of the end was less important than what the survivors did afterwards. It was entirely possible I would never know what happened. Perhaps everyone had simply vanished. Had it been in the internet somehow? Had everyone with a cell phone or near computer been pulled into another dimension? Had a terrible creature come through our televisions and monitors? <laughs> I laughed. Something about the idea just seemed too ridiculous to be scary. I'd been scared of the static-filled television in Poltergeist when I was a kid, but I couldn't remember the last time I'd actually seen such static. That movie was over 30 years old now. It was strangely peaceful out, knowing where I was and where my car sat ready helped me remain calm. There was every chance something had gone wrong in West Virginia, and I'd get in my car and drive back to Columbus and find the whole world churning along as usual. I'd start seeing cars, although they were all parked, past a few farmsteads, some of which I checked out. All were empty of people, and none showed signs of struggle. I did note that many houses lacked cars, as if their owners had all driven somewhere. By the time the sun hit the horizon, just as I turned down the last vaguely familiar turn and approached the hidden pocket where I left my car, I was more curious than fearful. These people had to have gone somewhere in an orderly fashion. They hadn't simply died or disappeared. Right? And there sat my beautiful old Hyundai. I'd never cared so much about appearance until that moment when it seemed at once the most decrepit and most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Dark red and rusted a bit about the wheel wells, it waited faithfully for my return. I unlocked it and climbed inside with an exhausted sigh of relief. This was civilization, signal or not. This was human ingenuity made subservient. This was a machine, and the machine was mine. That gave me power over my situation once more. The car roared to life with a guttural shout that matched my own. The silence and calm of nature ruptured instantly, replaced by the machine rumble of human design. I checked my phone. Still, no signal. No matter. I knew vaguely where I was going. Headlights bright to slice the way the glowing gloom I pulled onto the pavement. Just as I did, I looked back in the rearview mirror and almost hit a tree. For a heart-stopping split second, I thought I'd seen someone in the woods behind me. Swerving to return to the road, I spared a glance toward my side-view mirror, but I saw nothing. I certainly wasn't going to stick around to find out. The terror of that moment faded as the drive deepened into a familiar journey. I did have the oddest sense now that someone or something was following me in the pitch blackness behind me on the highway, but I had to shake it off after three headlights off attempts to perceive anything back there. Driving without light wasn't smart, and I had to carry on. All right, all right. I had to distract myself. I stick to major highways first, no back roads. Up 77, then west on 70. That was the plan. 
All right, I distracted myself. Who was I? It was me. I was driving, I was heading home. I hadn't seen a single other person in days, or a month, really. Had there been an emergency? I turned on the radio. It had to be done, but at an emotional level, I immediately understood that I'd made a mistake. The sounds on the air were spacious, breezy, and subtly twisted. It sounded like I was listening to a deep cavern, the depths of which hosted something terrible and unknown. A void. Nothing save for the occasional static. The dark oral caress hammered home the reality that something was very wrong. I flipped the channel. I flipped it again. I flipped it twice more. Loud rock music blared through the car, and I clutched the wheel in momentary terror. For a brief moment, my spirit soared, spurred on by that touch of normalcy. Until the song ended and another began, with no voiceover in between. I listened for half an hour. And nobody ever spoke. It was automated. Somebody had left their station running on autopilot. I clicked off the radio and glanced behind my car again. Nothing presented itself from the absolute darkness behind, but I still felt invisibly pursued. All right, I told myself, heart thundering in my chest. I'd been out in the woods and something had happened and I somehow had been spared, which meant that there had to have been others. I hadn't been the only person on earth in the woods in the last month. Somebody had to have survived. And who are you? I knew I was going to write it all down to make sense of it, as I always did. The written word is the best weapon against unclear realities. Who are you, then? Who would read this? I saw you, a vague possibility of someone reading this. Online, perhaps. At a computer, probably. I could feel some numbers of readers hovering in the fog of the future in the same way that I usually felt the beating hearts of those around me when we stumbled into living nightmares. That, more than anything, let me know something out there still existed. If the electricity was still working out in the boonies, was the internet still functional? I had to contact Heath. He could help. How long would the power grid remain operational without oversight? Not long, I knew. In that case, I did happen to know where a power plant was. I'd driven by the facility a few times over the years. If the power grid was still operational, that meant someone had to have been maintaining it. If there were people left, that was where at least some of them would be. I drove long into the night, reaching the outskirts of my home city only as dawn began cycling up around the earth yet again. I was tired, but mightily fueled by adrenaline. I couldn't see the city's buildings this far out, but I was confident that I would find people this way more effectively than wandering around an abandoned downtown quadrant. I pulled off the road some distance down and walked the rest of the way. Fences surrounded the vast complex, and I circled until I found the entrance. There didn't seem to be any security. Then again, why bother locking things if there's nobody around? The complex didn't have any windows, so I couldn't tell if there were any lights on inside, but I began to hear the deep rumble of machinery. I was wary, but desperate to see another human being. I pushed open a side door harsh light streamed out, forcing me to blink, and I stood there as a dozen men and women in hard hats froze and stared at me. It suddenly occurred to me that my personal mental illness theory might have some weight. What did these people see? A disgustingly disheveled, a wilderness man busting onto a power plant floor? They stood at various places around the vast space. Each of their specific stations are frozen in place on the way somewhere. 
A few had clipboards in hand. It was 2015, why were we still using clipboards? Come on. Several awkward moments passed, but none of them said a thing. I stepped closer and they watched me warily. Hello, I asked, my unused voice cracking. Hello, one man in slightly nicer clothes said, stepping forward. He waved to his subordinates and they all went back to work without a word. Can I help you, sir? I studied his stony but kind features. This was a normal middle manager type, like I'd seen in any number of offices. Uh, <clears throat> I coughed twice. Should I really ask questions that now sounded insane? I've been, a uh, camping for a month and I couldn't help but notice there are a great many people missing. The traces of kindness in the older man's cheek vanished. I narrowed my eyes cautiously. Did I miss something important? He stared at me, his shoulders subtly tensing. You should go. I took a step back. I didn't mean anything by it, I just... He lowered his voice to a whisper, to the point that his subordinates wouldn't overhear his words. You should go. Now. And if you run into people out there, don't ask stupid questions. Not one to take such seriously intended advice lightly, I nodded and slowly backed out, keeping my eyes on him the entire time. He made no move to stop me or follow me. Once outside, I bolted through the rising dawn light. My sensation of being followed was sharper than ever, and I leapt into my car as fast as I could. Speeding off, I headed for the only other place I knew to go. Home. On the way there, I rose above downtown on a soaring highway, and I was forced to take it all in. The sky rises glittered in the morning sunlight, but that glitter was dark, and the city was silent. The lights still worked, and my cell phone began getting signal, but Columbus, Ohio was empty. The city was empty, but there were still skeleton crews running the infrastructure, and they'd been terrified and confused to see me. It didn't make sense. I'm sitting in an empty Starbucks now, using the free Wi-Fi. I worked in the store in my college years, and it's intensely eerie to sit alone in it during what's normally the afternoon rush. If this is an apocalypse, it's the strangest one I've ever heard of. No death, no destruction. Some people are left that refuse to answer questions. Readers whose existence I can't pin down or understand. Where are you? And something following me out in the quiet streets. I feel it waiting for me to make a move. I think it knows I'm going to go home, but I have no choice but to try. But I'm going to make sure I'm prepared. I'm going to outsmart it. I have to, because I'm on my own. Wherever Heath is, he's not responding to my emails. That has me more worried than anything else I've seen. I'll keep my moves to myself until I get a chance to write again. Until I know what the thing pursuing me is, I can't risk it knowing what I have planned. At first, I didn't even realize that he was a human being. He sat motionless on a streetside bench. The tint of his skin and the dirtiness of his clothes nearly perfectly matched the weathered oak slats beneath and behind him. If anything, traces of white in his hair might have given him away sooner had I been more observant. After some time spent walking down the quiet suburban street under the feeble warmth of the clouded afternoon sun, a slight fluttering of clothed edges in the wind made him suddenly appear in my vision. I froze. I'd investigated the most obvious questions, of course. Found nothing. The internet had held no traces of what had happened. At the same time, any newspapers I came across were at least a few weeks old, and none mentioned anything related to the world's vast emptiness. Other people were the only 
source I had left for the truth. And, as much as I felt vaguely perused by some lurking threats, I hadn't seen another living soul since the power plant. I darted back around a corner to avoid being seen, and then stared past the edge while I studied him. The man was one of the very few people remaining, and he was alone. I needed a plan. I had a suspicion from what the power plant manager had said that nobody was going to talk to me directly about what had happened. They'd seemed disturbed that I'd ask, and some had even seemed afraid. Don't ask stupid questions. But why were the questions taboo? I needed a plan. All right, what did I have? I looked around. Low on fuel, I left my car a few blocks away and proceeded on foot to find a gas station. The GPS still worked, and the maps on my phone still helped, but I had to be certain before I chose a station to drive toward with my last remaining fuel. No more gas... No more car. I knew I could resort to stealing gas from the cars littered all over the suburbs, but I wasn't exactly sure how to do that, and I didn't want to go through all that trouble if I could avoid it. Was there a guide for stealing gas somewhere online? I resolved to look it up later. I was more than thankful for those inexplicable men and women keeping the infrastructure running. How inept would I be without the internet? A chill, sogginess hung over the road. Several shops and fast food places formed low canyoned walls on either side of an empty concrete river. A few side streets jutted off in either direction. What can I use here? My eyes fell on a gas station I'd already checked. The pumps hadn't been working, but the station itself had been stocked. I darted down the sidewalk. One of the glass doors sat unlocked, and I swung it open with mild surprise. I generally found very few locked doors. If anyone had disappeared, had it happened suddenly? None of the details were adding up. An odd smell permeated the interior, like something small and edible molding over in a corner, but the place remained that odd mix of organized and clutter that could only be found in a convenience store. The shelves hadn't been looted, as far as I could tell, and the refrigerators were still on. I left the price of my items in cash on the counter. A few minutes later, I returned to where I'd seen the lone man, this time with beers, five in my backpack and one in my hand. He still sat motionless on that brown street side bench, and I approached him with a tail in mind. As I got closer, I noticed that his extremely dirt-splattered clothes had once been a uniform of sorts. I also noticed that he wasn't moving at all. Was this the first dead body I'd come across? Eyes wide, I reached over an unkempt grass and picked up a small stick. He jumped at the prodding and I leapt back. Coughing lightly, he blinked weary and looked around in a wide circle before setting his sights on me. Oh, he sat up a little straighter. I was, uh, just taking a nap. I sheepishly put down the stick, carefully holding my beer bottle up to keep from spilling any. Got an extra one of those? He asked, his weather eyes lighting up with a strained eagerness wife never let me drink. Yeah, sure, I told him, sliding my backpack down to the sidewalk and pulling out another beer. Blue moon all right? He laughed briefly, took the offered drink, and spun the top off. <laughs> you got any oranges in there? No, sorry. Oh, well, he smiled. I'm Roger. He lifted the bottle high and took three large gulps. I watched quietly until he lowered it. After waiting for his long, satisfied sigh to end, I asked, Roger, how are things around here? You not from Columbus? He asked. Pittsburgh, I told him, carefully emulating subtle signs of exhaustion. I walked west, looking for work. 
He groaned sympathetically. <sighs> he used to be a lawyer. Turning his head, he threw a nod toward a massive white truck parked just out a distant corner. Slashes of rust were visible on various edges, and splatters of dirt were prominent along the bottom. Now I'm a garbage man. How about that luck? The garbage man? That meant more than just electricity and the internet were being maintained, and this man had to know where more people lived. Yeah, things didn't go too well for me either. A single laugh followed that. Hey, at least we're better off than the hunted. I tried not to stare at the capital H in the word he had used. What did that mean? Was it a clue? Had someone been hunted, or were they still being hunted now? I shivered at the thought of the ineffable presence that seemed to have trailed me from the Appalachian Mountains. Or, no, it hadn't been in the mountains. Not at all. I'd been free, clear, and alone up until the moment I'd reached my car. What had I felt then? A return to machinery? A human intellect? A return to civilization? A spark began building in my thoughts. Something vital, energetic, important. A connection. But to put it into words, to make it solid, I... He took another swig, then narrowed his eyes. I didn't think there was anybody left in Pittsburgh. How long have you been in Columbus? I feel like you should have run into somebody by now. Uh, just got in. Thrust back into the conversation, I gave a sheepish smile. Tried to hag it back home, but it was too lonely. That's what, a four-hour drive through mostly empty country? He asked, brow furrowed. Long walk without food and shelter. I nodded. Grabbed what I could. Food, beer, and such. Headed on out. Who's in charge here? I asked, trying to change the topic away from logistics. Who do I talk to about a job? Well, he began, thinking. If you ride my route with me, I can take you later, and... His words slowed to a stop after another sip of his beer. He looked down at the bottle and then up at me. I realized the error the same time that he did. I'd bungled my claimed timeline with the simplest detail. I couldn't possibly have just arrived here. The beer was cold. I'd taken it out of the refrigerator purely by habit instead of using one of the warm cases stacked near the shelves. After his realization, I expected suspicion. I expected narrow eyes, a subtle game of questions. Instead, he widened his eyes full of alarm and then began fumbling with something in his pocket. I picked up my backpack and began running the moment I saw it. He obviously wasn't very good with it or I might have not gotten away, but I did look back once to see him trying to aim the gun at me with his shaking hands. He shouted something terrified and angry as I made it around the corner. Heart pounding, it took only a few seconds to breathe and then I kept moving. I couldn't take the chance that he might get his garbage truck and chase after me. As I ran, I tried to understand what had I done that had been worth pulling a gun. Jesus Christ. I guessed that nobody would talk to me about what had happened, but I hadn't guessed at how terrified and defensive they might be, even at basic attempts to get information. I kept running through the chilly gray afternoon until I found the last turn back to the road upon which I'd tucked away my car. Heart pounding, breath ragged, I came around the corner and immediately saw the spot where I'd parked it. A spot which was now just a gap between other parked cars. After a brief moment of confusion in which I wondered if I had the right street, I realized that my car was gone. Ducking back behind some hedges so fast that I almost tripped, I'd study the street. My heart still thumped in my chest and my pulse still raced, but I did my best to stay absolutely silent. Two-story houses and thickening lawns flanked the road, and regularly set towering trees shrouded the area in icily breezy gloom. 
I shook against the exertion, still coursing through me, but I kept quiet and watched. Pushed forth by the wind, a colorful plastic tricycle rolled down a distant driveway. An American flag whipped idly up and down, unbothered by the cold. This was suburban life, just without the living. I found myself once more overwhelmed by how empty, boring, and normal this all felt. There were no bodies, no bloodstains, and no sense of tragedy. It was just a street. A street in which I had thought nobody would ever see or notice my car. I saw nothing to hint at what had happened to it. How long had I been gone? An hour? Two? Had another wanderer somehow happened across my vehicle and... What, hotwired it? It seemed exceedingly unlikely that somebody had just happened across this street and decided to steal my car as opposed to the thousands of ownerless vehicles parked all around the city. I felt in my pockets, confirming I still had the keys. That definitely wasn't it. Or was it... something else? I whirled around and fell roughly on my ass, my eyes scanning the nearly identical suburban street behind me. I saw nothing but chill gray filtering down between the trees and uncomfortably cold breezes sifting through hedges and bushes. The frigid lawn beneath me ran an unhealthy brown and green. The grass was only slowly coming back to life after a long winter. That odd sense of being pursued surged within me, and it became immediately obvious that the theft of my car had been no accident. Whatever it was, it was here, and it was just scrambling around in a suburban yard like a crazy fool, running between the houses, backpack straps held tightly to keep my bouncing belongings from making noise, I entered a long valley of backyards that seemed its own half-mile long world. On one side, houses, on the other, trees, and in between, strewn toys, a soccer ball, and a picnic table or two, all part of a miniature vista of discarded home life, stretching out before me like a dusky cave with a roof of ominous gray dark clouds. One of these goddamn doors had to be. The third one I tried swung open into gloom. I hesitated only for a split second and then became propelled forward by the feeling of some approaching titanic and horrible awareness rounding a nearby corner into the soon-to-be-defiled sanctity of my little backyard valley. I dared not to breathe. Instead, I turned around as swiftly and as silently as I could and ease the house's back door closed. The door itself was still mostly glass and I was nowhere near safe. Creeping further into the kitchen's shady gloom, I half-crawled behind the island that dominated the middle of the slippery white-tiled floor. I hadn't had time to absorb any other details about the space. All I knew was that the cabinets and countertops converged to hide a very small area from prying eyes that might be looking in the windows at that very moment. I hadn't yet seen any destruction, no broken windows, no busted doors. Would human constructions protect me? My back to dark cherry oak woodwork, my pack clutched close, I forced myself to let air flow in and out between my lips at an agonizingly slow pace. My hammering chest and burning lungs demanded more breath, but I couldn't. The light snap of a branch echoed feebly from outside. Was it my unseen pursuer? The door handle rattled. Adrenaline and alarm shot through me like lightning. Had I locked it? Had I thought to lock it? I could almost see the attention sweeping across the kitchen like unseen beams of malice-filled light. It scanned 
every visible corner, narrowly missing my hiding spot, and I stopped what little breathing I had still been managing, keeping completely still till the throbbing in my head threatened to knock me unconscious. My ears absorbed the barest sound of a handle rattling on the house next door. I almost let out an explosive breath until the thought occurred to me. I had no idea what was hunting me. What if there was more than one of them? What if one was still standing behind my back door and the distant entry attempt I'd heard was a ruse? Holding my own mouth shut forcefully with one desperate hand I remained in place, my vision slowly narrowing as each heartbeat brought me deeper toward darkness. And still, I couldn't bring myself to breathe. How could I be sure? At exactly that moment, the patter of rain began tapping against the windows. Could I use that? If the rain surged, could I... My body betrayed me. I let out an explosive gasp for air. And at exactly that moment, a loud crack rang out from somewhere beyond the windows. A loud scrambling echoed on the patio just outside the door I'd entered. And something gracelessly crashed away. A very human shout echoed from somewhere distant. Jumping to my feet, I took another deep breath, exhilarated by the return of life and chance, and I ran for the door. Spilling through, I saw a wide-eyed and brown-dressed man standing one yard distant under the darkening evening sky. In his hand, he gripped his gun, holding it awkwardly forward. It had been his shot that had driven off. Whatever had been outside... Roger! I shouted, incredibly relieved. Clearly something had changed. It was humanity against the darkness, right? Thank you! His eyes widened into even larger white circles, a terrified contrast to the oncoming twilight. What the ever-loving hell? His gun swept toward me. Christ! I shouted at him, charging back into the house. After everything I'd been through in my life, was I really going to finally get taken down by some scared old man with a revolver? Who the hell just carried a gun around like that? As I crashed through the house, accidentally knocking over family pictures and portraits of children hanging on the walls, I realized, if you were one of only a very few people left in the world, and there were otherworldly threats lurking, of course you would carry a gun. He was just a scared old man, and to him, I looked disheveled, homeless, and I'd proven myself to be a liar. Two, if he followed me, he might have seen me running and hiding and rolling out on lawns like a madman. He had no way of knowing I'd been tipped off by the disappearance of my car. He was just a scared old man. But he had a gun, and for as few times as I'd actually seen one in my life, let alone seen one fired, guns were undeniably real and deadly. I curved around the last bit of hallway and reached the front of the house. I almost opened the front door and bolted outside. I almost did it. It was only as I had my hand on the knob that I realized this heavy wooden door had no windows alongside it. I couldn't see outside, and if I was hunting someone in the situation out back had just happened, I would wait out front for my prey to cut through the house. It was fear, really, and nothing more. I'd been guided by my honed awareness for fear most of my life, and it had saved me countless times. Whatever was hunting me was perfect. It had made no noise, given no solid indication that it existed, and shown no cards. I had no idea what it might be, what it might want, or what it was capable of. Except, I did have one thing. The 
fact that millions of people had disappeared during my month in the mountains, and now those who remained were absolutely terrified to talk about it. The only edge I had was my fear. Where others might have panicked, where others might have been blithely unaware of pursuit, where others might have made a mistake, I was determined to survive at all costs. I took the last few steps up to the second floor with the same silent focus that I'd used the entire backwards path away from the door. I refused to let my eyes off that closed wooden portal. As long as it stayed closed, as long as I could make my way down the upstairs hallway and into a hiding spot, my pursuer would have to assume I'd chosen another escape route. As I stepped carefully backward, the gears in my mind spinning, I'd swiftly hung up and reset the pictures I'd knocked over. As far as it might see if it came in, I'd never entered the house. Step back, breathe ever so quietly, step back, finally make it round the corner. The front door clicked softly open just after the hallway below disappeared from view. The people that had lived here had left everything unlocked. I've been right to assume that nothing was going to go in my favor without me making it so. A creak sounded from downstairs. I couldn't stay in the hallway like this, as much as I wanted to remain motionless. Stepping carefully, Pax still held in a death grip, I backed smoothly and inaudibly into what I guessed from the layout of the house was the master bedroom. Where I'd stepped soundlessly on the stairs, my pursuer failed once, eliciting a subtle noise of stretching wood that would barely be audible beneath the pattering and surging rain outside. I stood in place in the thick gloom and listened intently. Was my pursuer heavier than me? Was it even human? Even at this distance, it smelled horrible, cloying-like. I turned my head, but not my body, to examine the room for options. Oh. Stealing myself for what I had to do, I eked a window open, studying the rooftop below that might let a person clamber down and leap to the ground. Slick rain coursed over every surface. I made my move and then lay quietly. What capabilities did my pursuer have? If it had a heightened sense of smell, my hiding spot would take care of that. In case it had sharp hearing, I kept my breath held, my body still, ready and willing to go back into that well of unconsciousness rather than die. Astute eyes would not be a factor with broken line of sight and my hiding spot already in a shape that might obscure my presence. If it were telepathic, or had other senses as well, there was nothing I could do about that. It came near, utterly near, and I thought I heard a slight, moist, organic sound. I felt a shift as weight moved along the master bedroom floor. Was it checking under the bed? No, it was at the window. After a silent, intense moment in which everything held frozen, Startling loud motion and creaking erupted, and I listened to it to rush back out, down the hall, along the stairs, and out through the front door. It was only then, deep in a swirling pit of shrunken senses, that I finally began breathing again. I gasped and choked on that fetid air, and clambered desperately out from between the two soggy, maggot-infested and fly-covered corpses on the bed. Drenched in black, rotting gore and various unidentifiable green and yellow-red slimes, I fell to the floor, letting my body force up the scant food I'd eaten earlier. Rubbing against the white carpet in desperation, I tried to get some of the corpse rot off my bare skin. They'd committed suicide, together, in that bed. The entire thing had been stained in the disgusting colors of life and death. 
There'd been just enough room between to hide under the sticky sheets and blanket. My hunter had either overestimated me in thinking that I could have silently climbed long and down a rain-slick roof or underestimated me in thinking that I would never climb between the embrace of two rotting suicide-slain lovers. I'm not invincible. I did break down. Finally, at that moment, on the white carpeted floor, now smeared wildly with grisly juices and goblets of flesh from my tearful crawl, I just wanted someone to talk to. Someone, anyone at all. What was the point of surviving if it required such ghastly and desperate acts? And if there was no way to go home to? It was then I knew that I had to get home. I'd been avoiding going straight there. It was too easy, too obvious. My pursuer would know what I was trying to do. That much I felt. I'd never met it, but the pursuit was hungry and personal. It had risked another encounter with Roger and his scared trigger finger to stick around and chase me. Chris. Caitlin. Where are you? Heath, why aren't you responding? And it's only now, while I sit in a hole-in-the-wall bar whose Wi-Fi password I remembered from long ago, that something occurs to me. A man and a woman had killed themselves together in the master bedroom of that house. But I'd seen pictures, even knocked those pictures down. Shots of kids, of children, happy and smiling. There had been no other bodies in that house. Is that a clue? I had no way of knowing. Not yet. I had to keep it in mind. In my life now, sitting in a hole-in-the-wall bar from my early twenties alone, eating stale cornbread with hands, I can't quite seem to get clean. I'm not afraid the smell of my horrendous hiding spot might never go away. No, I'm afraid I might get used to it. The world has changed, and the change happened without me. Why am I here? What am I doing? A relentless voice in the back of my head urges me on, even now. I live for the fear, and for the mystery. I always have. I have to know. I have to go home. I have to figure this out. I don't even think I can save anyone. I don't even hope that there's anything left for me but empty streets. Even though no one's around, I'm well aware that I'm unshaven, dirting, reeking to high heaven, and acting like a madman. But it doesn't matter. What point does life hold if there's nobody around to share it with? There's only one drive. I just... I have to know. And when the sun rolls back around the earth and dispels the empty and quiet night again, I'll make my play for home and hopefully have shot at finding more clues. I picked a serviceable watch from the display and then reached for my wallet. I counted the cash, but then, what did it matter? I put the money back in my wallet and departed, too tired from walking to feel bad about technically stealing a watch from an empty store. And two, my thoughts were elsewhere. It was just past noon by the time I arrived at the general area of my apartment. Still four blocks away, I stayed in the noisy shade near a billowing evergreen tree, and I watched the one highest monument on the near horizon a church bell tower. I was honestly surprised that it wasn't ringing by itself in the intensely surging afternoon winds. Just above the pinnacle of the bell tower, the sky hung black and glowing, threatening a tremendous storm at any moment. I thought the sky cave ceiling the day before. That effect had become even more pronounced. Even though I was standing out in the streaming winds and watching the distance, I still felt a little claustrophobic. 
The bell tower was the perfect vantage point for this neighborhood. From it, I'd be able to see my apartment and everything surrounding it. And I knew what I had to do. The church itself, like many other buildings around, had been left unlocked. The enormously thick wooden doors vibrated slightly with the gusting winds, but they did not open until I pulled in directly with much of my strength. The environs inside were startlingly normal. If someone had been hanging out in there, they might have never guessed the rest of the world had vanished. It was just somebody's neighborhood church. Velvet-lined pews faced a quiet and shaded altar, all crowned by lovingly hand-painted parables on the arcing ceilings high above. I sensed a few traces of faded despair and residual pain, but that was all drowned out by an almost glowing sense of peace and devotion. Devotion, above all, to the belief that everything was going to be alright. I suppose that made sense. Although it was rather startling how clear those sensations felt, they were practically a scent in the air, or a kind of almost visible spectral light. Were emotional residues more obvious now that the chaotic ocean of daily human feelings had gone? I wondered if the traditional belief might hold some weight. Could the hope and faith people imbued in places like this actually have the power to repel evil? I'd have to bet the negative on that one. Moving through the side halls, I found a set of winding stairs. Numerous signs warned me not to ascend unless I was staff only. Staff? Curious words for those who worked at a church. Made it almost sound like a business. To call the tight staircase rickety would have been soaring praise. I stepped carefully on each creaking piece of wood and the spiraling walls came so close that both my shoulders began brushing against their narrowing surfaces. After adjusting my backpack to fit, I actually considered turning back lest I get stuck like I was in some sort of tightening cave passage, but the final door soon appeared around the corner. Locked? No. That was a relief. I didn't want to waste needless time, and I did not relish in the thought of searching through some priest's office for keys. Pushing through that door was like splashing into a busy stream. Violent winds surged through the small square space at a near constant rate. Three of the walls sat open to the air with the high handrails as the only barrier to the void beyond. From here... I could see a vast sea of bare trees swaying with the oncoming storm. I turned back to my task. And there sat the bell. It was smaller than I'd expected. A rope trembled rapidly in the wind before me. I studied the places where it had been tied. I then carefully undid the knots and moved them to a new spot. This was the best vantage point, most definitely, and therefore the most dangerous place to be. My pursuit seemed very personal, somehow, and I had no doubt my hunter would know I was going to try and get home to find some answers. My hunter also knew that I was no fool, therefore it knew I would try to scout the area before I made my play. Slipping back down the stairs, I left the church just as I had found it, calm and quiet. Pushing out through the heavy doors, I re-entered the growing winds with a sense that time was growing short. I held my backpack in place and ran for the trees. Breathing hard from both exertion and sudden fear, I found a place to hide among thick bushes and evergreen trees, roughly one block from my apartment. Crouched Just between two brown-bricked buildings, I could see the front door from here, along with either direction up and down the street. I waited, heart pounding. The wind's illusion of busyness faded as I remained still and grew accustomed to the patterns in that swaying motion. The trees wavered, the bushes wobbled, the grass ran with waves of rolling air, but nothing moved. This street, like so many others, 
was dead and empty. A chilly and humid slice came in along the storm winds and I shuddered. For a time I thought I was being overly cautious, paranoid even, to assume that my hunter somehow knew me or where I was headed. I waited the risk of entering my apartment blindly. A single, extulent peal ripped out across the black clouds above. The bell. The hunter was here, but also firmly located blocks away. Burning with sudden adrenaline, I bolted from my hiding spot and ran straight for my apartment door. My pursuer would realize what I'd done almost immediately. I tied the rope to the door itself and then carefully positioned everything so that someone entering without knowledge of the trap would ring the bell at least once. It would know what I'd done, and it would know where I was in turn. That meant I didn't have much time. I started the timer on my watch, and it began counting down the estimate I'd made. I crashed through the living room, stomped up the stairs, and kicked my way into my own room. My stuff... My stuff had been moved. Nothing lay where I remember it. Somebody had been to my room in particular, and my computer was on. I entered my password to log on. And it didn't work. Well, it had been a while. Frowning, I tried another password I commonly use. And it worked. I went through my files quickly, noticing that things had been moved and files had been accessed during the last month when I'd been gone. Who the hell had been here? What'd they been looking for? Confusion rising, I tried to make sense of it. I'd been assuming that I was being perused in possibly the same manner as all the people that had disappeared, but what if it was just me? I looked down at my backpack, slung briefly on the floor next to me. What if it was for the contents of my pack? I spent a month in the goddamn woods for... My watch began beeping, pulse racing. I silenced it quickly and grabbed all the nearby papers I could, and my laptop. Yes, I stuffed it into the top of my pack and darted down the stairs, heading for the front door. I'd get out of the front purposely, assuming my hunter would shoot for the back to head off the route it expected me to use. But what if it had guessed that too? I didn't have time to react. I pushed through my front door and into the waiting, grasping hands. I fought viciously for a moment, but a few shouts brought me down. Hey, stop! Looking around in agitated confusion, I found myself surrounded by at least half a dozen men. The one that had grabbed me let go, but did not back off very far. His imposing expression and harsh features were betrayed by his casual tone. This the guy, Roger? Behind him, the older man nodded. That's him. A particularly strong gust of wind nearly straightened the shoulder-length brown hair of the man who seemed to be in charge of his little posse. He tilted his head back toward two pickup trucks, one black, one red. And both looked well-worn. You're coming with us. I looked at my building for a brief moment, considering another attempt to run. My pursuer would just now be reaching the backyard. All right. He grabbed my arm with surprising strength and pulled me along as the men scattered toward the two trucks. I couldn't help but notice they didn't have guns, well, at least not out in plain sight. Their leader, my temporary captor, spoke just loud enough for me to hear him over the whipping wind. Don't ask stupid questions. Don't ask stupid questions. I was word for word with the other guy. He lightly shoved me into the back of the lead pickup truck and climbed in alongside me. Two other men followed. Roger and an older Chinese man that didn't look too tough or brutish. These people didn't seem like thugs at all. They weren't trying to intimidate me as far as I could tell. Trucks began moving. Check his stuff, the long-haired leader ordered. 
He looked me in the eyes, evaluating my every subtle reaction. Keeping his eyes on me, he looked at a radio from his belt for a brief message. We found Roger's ghost. Yeah, he's real. Dirty as hell, too. Looks like he's been through some shit. Checking him out on the way. Hart nodded. I let them take my backpack and cell phone. I still had a few moments to think of something. I couldn't let them see what was in the bottom of that pack, but my computer was near the top and it would certainly warrant investigation first. The older Chinese man rooted through my papers. What's Glorwalk? he asked, leafing through some of them. I'd never heard of it. Had it been something the person invading my space had left behind? Maybe it was a clue. I shook my head and frowned. I don't know. How do you pronounce it? Gave me an odd look, but after a moment shrugged off my refusal to answer. And then pulled out my laptop just as I'd expected. What's the password? I grimaced, trying to look annoyed. If I could start a minor argument, I could buy some time to think. I'm not going to give you my password. I'm Jay, their leader interrupted, still watching my face for some unknown cues. I was a plumber. Still am. Nice to meet you. What were you... I held out my hand instinctively, but said nothing. Jay looked down, his eyes unreadable even as his hair leapt back and forth around his face. Slowly, he reached out his hand and shook mine. That ritual done, he looked back at his two men for some reason, then back to me. Give us your password. We're not going to do anything with it, we just need to see. I believed them. I did, it was just... Roger sat straighter and made a little noise of alarm. Jay, the phone. He handed it over. I frowned. What could he have possibly found on it? Jay studied the phone for a second, then glared up at me. What the hell is this? What is what? I asked, genuinely confused. Had Roger planted something on my phone to get me in trouble? A radio at his belt crackled to life without warning. Jay, we got somebody over here that claims to know your guy. Clutching my phone, he reached down with the other hand to answer. Hope surged in my chest. It was about time I got a break. Was it someone I knew? Was it Chris? Had he survived whatever had happened and been on the lookout for me? Lord, if they looked deeper into that pack. The trucks turned a corner, and a long, low whine began reaching my ears. Gradually, both vehicles came to a stop. The man in the truck bed with me froze and slowly stood. The man in the cabin of the red truck, just behind ours, froze and began looking out their windows. The man in that truck's bed slowly stood, their fearful gazes sweeping the area. As the sound intensified, I recognized its implicity. A tornado siren. Its long crescendo peaked, remained steady, and whined for several long seconds before anyone reacted. The sound filled me with intense fear. Not in the least because my favorite horror movies and games had used that very noise to signal the approach of very bad things. But even without a supernatural component, a tornado siren still meant very bad things for people caught out in the open. With the trucks motionless, I could feel that the wind had picked up to rather incredible strength. It still hadn't started raining. God almighty, Roger mouthed, his grip on the truck's edge white-knuckled. Let's go, Jay shouted, his radio forgotten. He pocketed my cell phone and slammed his hands on the roof of the driver's cabin. Go! They didn't need to be told twice, except they didn't start driving. They opened their doors and climbed down to the street. The men in the other truck saw him began following suit. Wordlessly but clumsily, as if they'd practiced it but never done it before, they pulled heavy wooden boxes down from the truck's beds and began handing out the contents. Jay took a moment to shove my pack into my hands and then gave me one of the bundles that the other men were receiving. You haven't earned any trust yet, but I guess it doesn't really matter anymore. A subtle grief and fear passed over his rough features. 
He looked up at the boiling black sky. Oh, we had more time. I frowned. It sounded like he meant more by that statement than just a race against the storm. Sliding my pack on, I freed my hands to investigate the bundle I'd been given. A variety of objects had been gathered together inside. Objects both common and weird. Most notably, I lifted a wooden knife from the pile. The men around me were stuffing everything they could into pockets and packs and everything else they had available. I followed suit and slid the knife under my belt. It didn't seem like it could really hurt anyone, but they'd pass these collections out for some reason. Let's go, Jay shouted again, and an abrupt motion took over the group as each man noticed and began running after the others. I followed him back, wondering why the hell we'd abandoned the trucks to proceed on foot. I could have slipped away, I knew, but intuition kept me near the only other human beings in this city as they ran from dangers unknown. I had no idea where we were headed. All I could do was follow the men down a one identical suburban street after another. And they, in turn, could only follow Jay as he kept up an unrelenting pace. Many of my muscles began straining with little bits of fire as we ran, but the fear was strong enough to ensure I would run to my very collapse if so needed. I felt it before I saw it. A slight purple glint came under my focus. I'd already been looking right at it, even before it had appeared. It was maybe a block ahead, right at the corner of someone's expansive lawn. Someone shouted over the roaring winds, and the others noticed it too. Jay turned our angle suddenly and headed for it. We clustered around it in awe. It's actually happening. One man commented, his eyes wide. Roger shook his head and frowned with pained fear. Jay began rooting through his own pockets. Maybe five feet above the ground, it floated and glimmered quietly. A jagged little glowing purple line. A rip. And nothing. As we watched, it began to grow thicker. The purple glow intensified, as if welling out from something deep inside. Reaching out, Jay began tying something dark and thick around it. Once, twice, three times. Come on, guys. He said, his eyes on the task, his tone determined. We can handle this. We... The jittering pulse in that purple slash popped its restraints right off. He took a breath. Okay. That didn't work at all. Even as we stood there, another glimmer of purple appeared down the street. He shook his head in three exaggerated motions, the gears in his thoughts visibly turning. At long last, he winced. Let's just run. There's nothing we can do. He took off again, and we followed in two haggard lines. For a time, there was only huffing, running, and the wind at my back, but I'd gotten strong enough that it was actually making the run easier, and it blinked out all sound except for an ongoing roar. For that reason, the lack of sound, it took the group nearly two minutes to notice. I couldn't make sense of the feeling at first. It was the usual twinge, a plucking on the strings of my fear, but it was coming from above. The black rolling sky hid them until they were dangerously low. I stared up and slowed, little flashes of light, ethereal, a brief instance of white, but no, not white. By the time the entire scattered group had slowed to a standstill, the silvery strands were drifting down all around us. The strands that were eerily unaffected by the raging winds. Jay thought for a moment and then shouted something at us in alarm. We couldn't hear him. Realizing the problem, he grabbed his wooden knife and lifted it up for everyone to see. Not sure what the hell I was supposed to do with it, I grabbed mine too and held it ready as long, silky strands of silver began gently piling around us. Our determined leader pointed at a nearby house, but there was no time. The first of us touched a slowly falling strand by accidentally backing into it. In a flash, it whipped taut and... 
Christ. Wrapped around his neck, writhing like a living and wickedly dead snake coiling around its victim. In shock, the middle-aged and slightly chubby man dropped his wooden knife. Jay leapt up and slashed the strand just before it managed to lift up viciously. The rescued man fell to his feet, grabbed for his knife, and immediately ran afoul of another filament which wrapped savagely around his arm and began coiling up toward his neck again. This time there was nobody to save him. A pale fiber pulled Jay back by the leg, and the entire group began flailing against sudden gripping strands. Intensely focused, I moved only forward so that I would avoid backing into any of the deadly filaments. I stared up at an angle, not daring to blink, staying motionless until I judged a single step safe. Step. 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 Screams echoed on the wind. Step. I looked away for an instant to judge my distance at the front door of the house Jay had indicated. Force whipped up my torso and around my neck like suddenly applied leash. Instinctively, I gripped the strand with my left hand and found it impossibly smooth and cold. That grip was probably the only thing that kept my neck from breaking as I was jerked forward and up with brutal force. In shock, nearly to the point of being unable to think, I slashed with the knife in my right hand with nothing but animal fury. I didn't really have a chance to think about where I was, at least not until the choking grip released and I found myself on the downward slope of a roller coaster without a car. The impact came as a massive crack against my entire left's half. Gasping, I rolled to the side in abject pain and fell again, my numb left arm caught in something weak and metal that was already giving way. Even as I tried to catch my breath and stop my awareness from spinning, the metal gutter traveled a long arc through space. I smacked to the ground proper, tears flung from my face by sheer force. Somehow I still had my wooden knife, and I slashed at another sudden grip on my numb left leg, and then I took the knife into my burning left hand, used it to slash at the new leash on my right arm. Hold it, goddammit! Someone shouted. They're gone! They're gone! Forcing my eyes to focus through the panic, I realized that the last grip had been the hand of an older man. He'd only just barely avoided my slash. Shivering as he pulled me up, I managed to breathe. <sighs> Sorry. He glared, but seemed to understand. Around me, many men were looking up. I joined them, watching two bodies soar up into the black tumult along a cloud of silver strands. No time, Jay panted, nursing a deep red wound on his neck. Move. Keep moving. Nobody had any words or breath left to respond. Instead, tired and desperate men helped each other to their feet, and we began stumbling forward. The first drops of icy rain started pummeling us as we started passing a still-frozen lake at the edge of the suburb we'd been cutting through. Roger was the first one to see her. There's somebody out there! The thin, older man who'd been helping me along turned his head. Is that a girl? Is she trying to cut across the lake? Someone asked, confused. We gotta send somebody out there to get her, Jay thought aloud. We can't leave anyone behind. I stared, my soul jumping with repeated surges of invisible electricity. Overwhelmed, I decided to sneak up despite not knowing whether these men were friend or foe. They were still human, right? I couldn't let them go out there. I knew exactly what that was. My whispered words seemed to cut through the wind in panic and slice directly into their awareness. Jay, there's nobody alive on that lake. Fifteen feet away, he turned his head slowly to stare at me. I could almost see the conflict between the normal guy that worked most of his life as a plumber and the man he needed to be now. In that moment, I was certain he was someone to be trusted, and yet... 
He seemed more frightened to his core by me and what I'd said than by the purple cracks still opening up all around or the silver strands from on high. I watched him gulp down a choking knot in his throat. He continued to stare at me as he spoke. Is the girl moving at all? I kept his gaze. In the corner of my vision, Roger shook his head slowly. Actually, I don't think so. She's just standing there. He jumped. No, wait, she's waving. She's waving us over. It does look like she needs help. Jay trembled subtly. You don't want to be a part of that story, I told him, dead serious. He took in a deep breath. We have to go. What? Another man asked. We gotta help her. No. He said flatly, his own order, ashes on his lips. That girl is already dead. Don't look at her. We're leaving. They did look back, of course, but something about their otherwise stalwart leaders, despairing demeanor, kept them from arguing any further. He looked back at me with suspicion, but said nothing. Something enormous crashed through the backyards to our right, shaking the row of houses directly. As a group, we veered to our left and ran through the backyard groves to stay out of sight. A cloud of yellow and cyan gas rolled through the woods around us. It seemed to chase us and cling to us in hungry earnest, but instructions were passed around to eat the foul-tasting pink bubblegum-like substance from our bundle. I popped it into my mouth and nearly threw up, but... The disturbing cloud of gas reeled away from us as if struck by a physical blow. As fast as it had come, it darted off into the trees. We emerged from the trees at that exact instant. The pattering rain broke into a blasting torrent. As water continually surged against my face, I held my arms up and struggled to see. Something was on fire ahead and to our left, a massive green flame that seemed unaffected by the rain. Stomping out the mud, the group headed to the right. At the end of my endurance, I slowed. Through the curtains of rain, I sighted what must have been their center of operations. In that case, I turned and ran a different direction, intent on hiding and scouting out what they were doing up by myself, without their control. I couldn't be sure what they'd meant to do with me, but I felt safer on my own. They had someone who claimed to know me. That was a lead, but what if it was my hunter or some other enemy? I couldn't let the contents of my backpack fall into the hands of anyone other than myself, and nobody in this damn city is willing to talk about where everyone has gone. I have to find out at any cost. So, I'm sitting in a basement waiting out the storm while everything goes to hell outside. For some reason, I'm not afraid. The terrors out there were all random. They're not specifically after me. It's the hunter that I have to fear. And those chaotic nightmares out there have stalled the hunt for the night. In a weird way, I feel safer, surrounded by untold horrors lurking just outside than I ever did alone in a city with other human beings. I wonder what the world will look like tomorrow. I've always found something innately beautiful about raw nature. It existed for time beyond measure, and it'll outlast us all. There are vast galactic clusters and long dead stars so far away that we still see them shine, and there are organisms of every size that feast upon one another in a chaos of life, death, and survival. As I descended from the crest of a rough high hill where one half of that spirit was evident and then pushed my way through the brush and tangle below where the other half ruled, I wondered at the ability of nature to still exist the way it did out in the wilds. 
with all the cities humanity has carved into Earth, with all the billions of us walking and driving and flying about, how could whole mountain ranges still sit out here so free of our contamination? Ongoing powder dripped slowly around me, not rain, but a long-awaited melting above, below, and all around. Endemic white trails still clung to every bowl and shadow, awaiting higher angles from the sun. I paused where I stood, taking several moments to catch my breath and feel the wind. I frowned. I had the strangest feeling. I turned my head as if to try and listen to some distant note. Something was wrong. I hurried on. It took the better part of a day to reach a road. By then, the sky was a blazing sea of drifting orange, and I was vitally tired. I sat on the curb for a time, idly watching the traffic. It was rather busy for some backwoods road in northwestern West Virginia or wherever I was, but no way in hell I was going to hitch a ride with a stranger. It was too risky. Nobody could even be allowed to guess what I'd been doing. The oncoming night brought a returning chill that refroze the wet ground. I despised the cold, but it did make the walking easier. Rather than slogging through squelching mud, I moved quickly across frozen earth following the road. All I needed to do was find a building, any building really, and charge my laptop. After that, a single power button press would hook me back into civilization. And gloom set in, replacing fiery orange with fuzzy blue, which itself faded ever so slowly into impenetrable black. Still, I walked. I dwelled on the high tension that had strung itself along the skies of my mind. Distant, barely visible, but most definitely there, and very disconcerting. What was wrong? I ran through the possibilities for hours, but lacked the data to draw any strong conclusions. The ground changed underneath my shoes, and the wind began sliding perpendicular to me. I'd come to a larger road. A few scattered cars rolled past, interspersed among heavy trucks bound for some distant city. I knew which direction I needed to go, and headed on without slowing. Eventually, I stopped to rest. After four weeks in rugged forest, the road's edge felt like a luxurious hotel. I sat deep among thick bushes, hopefully far enough in to avoid being seen. The cloudy sky hid the stars and kept me blind, but the darkness didn't bother me. There were terrible things out in the night sometimes, sure, but the open sky and quiet forest felt empty and calm. This was not one of those places where horrible fates lurked. This was simply... Nowhere important. I awoke to burgeoning gray light. The passing vehicles had kept me half awake, so I was less rested than I might have been otherwise, but I felt safer for not having gone completely out of it. Walking along the road in a drifting ocean of swirling dawn light, I kept my thoughts simmering, not wanting to obsess too much further over the strange feeling that something was terribly wrong. Warm relief welled up around my heart as I sighted, at long last, a gas station. It sat at a gravelly corner in the country road, quietly soaking up near-noon spring rays. Worries dispelled, I marched right up to the decrepit, once-white building, eager to get back to civilization. The door opened easily, and a bell chirped above me as I swept in. The clerk ignored me opting instead to stare blankly at a small television set on the counter. It was dingy and quiet, deeper within, but I shrugged off my inexplicable discomfort and grabbed a few snacks and supplies from the shelf. I found an outlet, got my laptop out of my backpack. It lit up without an issue, and I sighed happily. A flood of messages and emails would inform me of the situation at large. I frowned. No signal. No wireless at all, password protected or otherwise. Of course. 
It would have been too easy to simply have it all work, right? No. We're going to put me through the gauntlet here. A curious screeching noise echoed outside, like a car engine straining against waking cold, and I froze. It was already happening. Had our projected timeline changed? Were events moving forward at a faster rate than we'd predicted? I had to contact somebody. I couldn't wait. Can I make a call? I asked, heading up to the clerk. He turned and watched me without reaction for a moment, and then narrowed his eyes as if he'd only just now understood my question. A feeble wave of his hand indicated the positive, and I picked up the phone by the register as he went back to watching his show. I frowned and tried to recall phone numbers from anyone I knew. God, I didn't know any phone numbers by heart. There simply hadn't been a need to remember. Momentarily unsure about what to do, I stood in place, thinking. In my pocket, my cell phone vibrated, and I grabbed it, canceling the call. Who would even be calling me right now? Who would even know that I was back in range of civilization? I couldn't let anyone interact with the contents of my cell phone. I didn't recognize the number. There was no time to delay. I dropped some cash on the counter for the things I'd taken, even though the clerk didn't look or seemed to care. Back in the noonlight and warming breezes, I began walking and thinking I was never one to miss telltale signs. Had the clerk simply been bored, or had something else been wrong with him? The odd delays in his behavior made me wonder if he was alright. I came to a crossroads and stopped. The crossing road seemed wider and more traveled than the one I'd been walking down. I waited for a tick for the cars to clear and then started forward. I jumped back. The cars weren't stopping or slowing for me. They didn't even seem to know I was there. As I'd stepped out, a guy in a truck had turned onto my part of the road and blown right past me. I waved at a few passing cars, noticing that none of the drivers so much as looked over. They just kept driving, their eyes held straight ahead. That, combined with my growing sense that something was off, made me very cautious. Was something happening to people out here? Had a disease spread that made people less aware or something? Or... Was it me? Was something wrong with me? The clerk had reacted to me somewhat, so I knew I hadn't become invisible or something. I didn't see anything wrong with my hands, arms, or legs. I felt around, confirming my mouth, long beard, and what was going on here? Something might have been wrong with all the people driving by, or something might have been wrong with me. I couldn't trust my perceptions. How could I know the true nature of anything I was doing? Could I even cross the street? What if the cars I were seeing were not the cars that were actually there? I'd step out to the pavement, get crushed. My pulse began racing as the gears of my logic started to grind. And I stared up and down the long country highway. If my perceptions were flawed, what was I supposed to see to clue myself in? The mind believes what the brain perceives. If I thought I was looking at these particular passing cars, then no amount of staring or concentration would compromise that evaluation. Hell, there could be people stopped right now asking a crazy guy standing at the side of the road if he was alright, but... But all I heard were the rising and falling whines of passing engines. I couldn't cross the street, any street. What had I actually said and done in the gas station back there? Why had the clerk looked at me so strangely? What had I been doing out in the woods this last month? I knew what I thought I'd been doing, but uh, objectively the idea did sound ridiculous. I only trusted because I trusted myself and the experiences I had. If I couldn't trust those, how did I even know I was me? I guess some things you have to take for granted. Bending down, I grabbed a dirty white shirt out of my backpack. I'd had a marker, too, in a side pocket, but I couldn't find it. 
Crafting some daub from mud at the side of the road, I quickly wrote out some words on my impromptu shirt base sign and held it up. Help. I am blind. Staring up at the crossroads, I held up the shirt at each stop sign and turned my eyes wide. I saw the car stopping, starting, coming, going, but how could I know for sure that they were really where I thought they were? I couldn't stay here forever. I had to keep going. 28, 29, 30. Holding the shirt up like a desperate flag of surrender, I edged out onto the pavement, body steeled against a terrible invisible impact at any moment. Unable to even breathe, I inched across the country road, heart rate spiking as I crossed each faded painted line. Heavy and feeling on the verge of passing out, I leapt the last two feet and tumbled to the gravel on the other side. Was anyone watching me? Had I looked insane and ridiculous? Were they going to try and help me? I waited, but none of the passing drivers seemed to notice or take care. Standing slowly, I tucked the shirt sign into my pocket and started walking again, not at all comforted. As the afternoon wore on, I debated my personal facts in an endless and painful cycle. Objectively, I had all the behaviors of a mentally ill homeless man. I had an inexplicable sense of impending doom, a rough demeanor, and I didn't even trust my own eyes and ears. It was an understatement to say that I didn't like what was happening. But all this would be fine if I could just get home. I just needed to get back there and figure everything out. I could reconnect to society and clear my head, right? That internal discussion fell away as I found myself walking up an on-ramp to Route 79. I actually knew where this highway was. It ran parallel to the mountains at some distance. I'd actually driven on it to get close to where I needed to go. Wouldn't be long now. It was strangely peaceful out, knowing where I was and where my car sat ready. It helped me remain calm. There was every chance something had gone wrong with the people in West Virginia, and I'd get in my car, drive back to Columbus, and find the world churning along as usual. Eventually, I turned away from the highway and passed a few farmsteads. I knocked on a few doors, but the people within, as I watched through their windows, went about their dinner preparations without paying me a single heed. By the time the sun hit the horizon, just as I turned down the last vaguely familiar turn and approached the hidden pocket where I left my car, I was certain something sinister was going on. Instead of approaching my car straight on, I darted through the trees, my suspicions running high. And there sat my beautiful old Hyundai. I never cared much about the appearance until that moment when it seemed at once the most decrepit and most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Dark red and rusted a bit around the wheel wells, it waited faithfully for my return. Before I could get near it, Someone climbed inside and slammed the door. Suddenly furious, I bolted toward it, moving through the trees as fast as I dared. The car roared to life. The silence and calm of nature ruptured instantly, replaced by a machine rumble of human design. The driver within looked down briefly and then flicked on his headlights. He pulled out onto the pavement and swerved heavily, nearly hitting a tree. He'd seen me or at least he'd seen my silhouette in the tree-shaded gloom. And I'd seen him, completely by the light of his cell phone. I stood in place for a moment, thoughts cold and calculating. I'd been completely right. Something terrible had happened. The other driver was me. Okay, all right. What's the plan? What do I need to do? Head him off. Find out where he'd come from, what he's looking for. How would this happen? What were the facts? What did I know? Keep cool. Think it through. Normal people were acting lethargic and having great trouble seeing or responding to my presence. I'd spent a month in the woods, as far as I knew. I had something to protect in my cell phone, something which I'd spent weeks searching for out there. 
and there was another me running around, slightly ahead of me, oblivious to the nature of what had been done to us. Where would I go if I were me? Home. I had to get home. That, and I had to contact Heath. And I had to make sure I reached him first, before that other me talked to him. Fast food. That's where I needed to go. Somewhere with Wi-Fi. Running down the long country roads, I headed for one of the farmsteads I checked out. Opening the front door gently in case my hypothesis was wrong, I walked slowly past the family eating dinner at their kitchen table. They ate in eerie silence and saying nothing. Though that just might have been how they ate together. It was impossible to know. Looking around, I found a set of keys, and then walked right out to the driveway and tried them in the closest truck. It roared to life, not caring whether I was its rightful owner or not. I'm taking your truck, I shouted, testing the family's reaction as I watched them through the window. They didn't react. I'll bring it back. Eventually, I called. Pulling out onto the road, I took one last look at the house. No reaction. That was that, then. A few minutes later, I stopped at the nearest McDonald's. I parked down the street and walked, not wanting to be connected to a stolen vehicle. Pushing inside, the familiar smells and noises immediately lessened some of my stress. I tried not to look too hard at the workers, who were slowly and silently going through the motions of making food. The world was still here. No matter what was happening, there was still a chance to clear it all up and fix things. I pulled my laptop out and set it up, eyeing the other patrons. An old man and his wife sat in the far corner, munching on fries. They stared rather absently at their food as they ate. I watched them for quite some time, but neither spoke. The old man's milky white eyes seemed perfectly paired with his blank stare. A teenager in rather baggy clothes sat at another table, carefully placing one chicken nugget at a time in his mouth, moving and chewing at the same pace as... His eyes jumped to mine for the barest split second. Hey! I shouted, leaping up as he kicked away from his seat and darted for the door. Wait, I I'm not going to hurt you! He got caught on the doors, his baggy shirt sleeve catching on something just long enough for me to catch up. He pushed frantically as I came near. Don't touch me! Why would I touch you? I asked, following him as he continued out into the parking lot. He slowed when I'd slowed, remaining twenty feet away. How are you normal? I don't even know what's going on, I told him, keeping my hands visible and open. I just came out of the woods after a month-long camping trip. What the hell is wrong with everybody? He stared at me for three heartbeats, sizing me up. Finally, he said three words. Don't touch him. And moved to run off. Just before he took his third step, he paused, turned, and threw me some sort of insect. I stared at him in confusion. What's this? Sorry, he said quickly. I meant a bag, not a bug. Oh. I nodded, opening it to find a foul-smelling pile of gritty particles inside. We all make mistakes. If you do touch one of them, rub that on the spot right away. It'll burn that crap right off. You got like ten seconds. He darted off without another word. I hadn't been even remotely about to touch on any of the oddly acting folk, but I decided to take his warning and his folk remedy to heart. Whatever this disease was, it must have been communicable. Anyone who tried to help fell victim as well. But what did this have to do with my doppelganger? Where did he and I fit into all of this? I reached for my cell phone and checked that it had not been tampered with. This couldn't have been the fault of anything I'd brought back, could it? I shook my head after running through a few possibilities. That motion brought back the pain I'd been feeling, and I kneeled for a moment, trying to catch my breath against the dull throbbing. I focused against the pain and let it pass. 
Walking slowly back inside, I gave the interior a quick wary scan. I didn't want to be caught off guard at the slow moving and oblivious folks suddenly became hostile. And so tired. Why was I so tired? My head felt intermittently foggy. It didn't matter. Logging on to the restaurant's Wi-Fi, I wrote out an email. Heath, there's something very wrong here. People are acting strange, and I think there's a copy of me out there. Has he tried to contact you? The response came back rather quickly. What's your location? I frowned. Why does that matter? I need to know where you are. I closed my laptop slowly. This was not at all the response I'd expected. Had he been compromised? Or had my email been intercepted by someone else entirely? Fighting that strange tiredness, I pushed my way out of the restaurant, headed down the street, and recovered the truck. On to Columbus. I drove for hours, keeping silent to match the darkness flowing by my windows. For a few minutes, I did turn on the radio, but the music seemed to hurt my awareness directly through my ears. At some point, I was forced to pull over and sleep. I pulled the truck off to the side of the road to avoid being seen and curled up in the back seat. That weird fatigue must have hit me harder than I'd expected because it was noon by the time I woke. Suddenly full of terror that I'd fallen far behind the other me, I pulled back onto the road and headed out. I made it to Columbus proper in just a few hours and drove through familiar streets with an eye out for the behavior of those I passed. They all walked and moved with a subtle slowness and ignored me. One old man crossed the street right in front of me and I was forced to brake as quickly as I could. Low on gas, I began looking for a station. And that was when I saw it through a row of trees and houses. My car. I knew it immediately from the rust spots above the wheel wells. Parking abruptly one block away, I got out and ran toward it. It was just sitting there on the side of the street as if its operator had simply come to visit somebody here. Looking around, I saw a blank-eyed man mowing his lawn under what warmth the spring sun was providing. A kid rolling around in idle circles on a colorful plastic tricycle and an American flag whipping up and down in the wind. No sign of the other me. My keys still worked, though I hadn't really doubted that they would, and I revved the engine to life without hesitation. I felt much better having my car back, and with it some semblance of control. Perhaps there was a way out of this, if I could just get home. I coasted quietly down the street, gaze alert. And just as I turned a corner, I saw him. He was hiding behind a bush, studying the spot where our car had been. He wore the same clothes and backpack as I had on. Was that how he used my car? Had our belongings been duplicated as well? What phenomenon? The phone. Was his cell phone also a duplicate of mine? Had he interacted with it? Had he used it? I slammed the car to a halt and leapt out. He was gone by the time I came back around the corner on foot, but there was only one way he could have fled. I had to warn him. Running between the houses, I came to a long, low valley of backyards overcast by a heavy and looming sky. Two very different families sat outside, eating idly and slowly at picnic tables. Where had he gone? I saw the back door on the third house down slowly moved close. My every muscle on fire with fatigue and exertion, I ran for it but found it locked, looking in the glass panels and then in the kitchen window. I tried to see if he was inside. You crazy boy? An older man asked, and I turned suddenly at finally being spoken to first. It was about time I met somebody who could give me answers, and I froze. He had a gun. Christ. Was he worried about people touching him too, or was it for self-defense? I needed to know what was going on before I made a fatal mistake. What are you doing? He prompted quietly. You stupid? Have you touched any of them? I shook my head, 
walked slowly, staring at his eyes and hands during alternating heartbeats, which would give away his intent to fire first. Just tell me what you want me to do, I said softly, even as a few drops of rain began tapping on my forehead. Families at the picnic table didn't seem to notice. If you could just tell me what's going on. His eyes widened at that, and he lifted the gun a little higher. A shot went off before I had time to react, but I didn't feel struck. Nerves of fire, I ran straight through the bushes behind me. As I ran, I heard a door open roughly near where I'd been, and the old man shouted, What the ever love in hell? The shout was followed by a single exclamation. Christ! My voice. Which direction would he go? I had to warn him. If it was me, I'd go through the house. I waited against the bricks near the front door, wondering just how long I dared to stay. The rain began falling harder. Would it interfere with the old man's gun? I shivered and waited some more, ready to run at the first sign of danger, but I heard nothing. In fact, I tried the front door and it opened smoothly. It didn't seem like he'd come this way. I looked around the front hallway and then up the stairs. My peculiar intuition reconstructed a path that he might have taken if he had come through the house. I had to make sure. Climbing the stairs carefully, I inched down the upper hallway, entering a miasma of foul rot. Had something died up here? Rain pattered on the roof above as I passed two rooms where blank-eyed children sat staring at textbooks in a mockery of studying. Not there. Not in there. The master bedroom. I entered the space with a hand over my nose. Three lumpy corpses lay under the sheets, rotting, horrific, and bloody. Evidently, someone had not wanted to go out the way their children had. Judging by the ghastly arrangement of lumps, they must have taken one with them and then been too pained to hurt the other two. Eyes brimming from the residual pain and terror I felt still echoing about the room, like desperation and fear hiding in darkness, I approached the sweet and humid breeze. The open window. He'd escaped along the roof. Damn it! I ran as fast as I could back out and down the stairs, hoping to catch up to him somehow. If he looked in that cell phone, if it was like mine, God, what options did I have left? Out on the street, I almost tripped over four children. They stared blankly at one another, feebly kicking a ball back and forth. As I got back in my car and prepared to drive off, it struck me. These people had no idea anything was wrong with them. These kids were playing ball in the street. To them, life must be going on as normal. Were they speaking to one another somehow in a way that I couldn't understand? Or were they just imagining themselves holding conversations? I knew then what I had to do. I had to try and find that old man and get some explanation out of him. Home could wait, at least for a little while. The only people left conscious and aware had to have answers. Because nobody else even knew anything was wrong. My fingers. Ice. My hand clenched numb. My arm. Burning. A torrential force continually assaults every sense and nerve. Am I gripping a branch of razor's breadth from the edge of a massive waterfall? It threatens to tear me down and destroy me at every surge. Between constant bouts of near suffocation, I writhe, fight, and struggle to catch a single breath. The roar drowns out all sensible sensations, leaving nothing but random violent swells smashing against my face over and over and over, each lung full of air at the end of all endurance and hope. I manage to find a single, free gasp. I stumbled forward, suddenly free, for a split second, a moment, a heartbeat, a phone, 
A phone. My good old subconscious is still on my side. It was already heading for it. It knew, somehow. I grasped it, but hesitated. What did I have? What senses? What mental objects? Sight. A phone. Blink white, smudged fingers. Are those my hands? Memories were beyond reach. A fog. A storm. What could I do to reach him? Nothing. I couldn't do anything at all. But he could reach me. I took a deep breath, real air this time, and useless against that far more horrible kind of suffocation, and lifted the phone immediately to my ear. Time would be short. I felt imminently pursued. That in itself was another mental object. I filed it with the few others in my possession. The only defense we have against nightmares is the power of self-sacrifice. I forced out, choking on thickness in my throat, my voice unused for some unknown time. The crushing fist. G-L-O-R-W-O-C. The click came, even as I spoke. He'd heard my random keywords. So filled with concern and desperation, his voice shot adrenaline through me. Christ, where are you? Heath, I gasped out. I looked. God, I'm sorry. I need your location. Maybe I can... I shook my head. I'm broken. Stop repeating yourself, he responded. I wavered in place. Am I repeating myself? Tell me something, anything. Come on, brain. I kept the phone pressed against my pounding head, my strobing sight blinking erratically around the room as I felt the impending drum beats quicken. What did I have? My split second was ending, and the waters were roaring back across my face as I sank in once more. Wait. White walls. I lifted my free hand. Smudges. On my fingers. That was it for my sight. I put my crumbling focus on my hearing. Pounding footsteps. Headed my way. Want to touch. Warmth. Leaking from my nose. Cold bubbling in my feet. And the smell. Tang of metal. The clicking together of a few separate mental objects, the fact that I was bleeding from my nose, spurred a swirl of other memories. I got them killed, Heath. Jay, Roger, just normal guys with jobs and lives. Just hold on, he told me, compassionate and firm. We're going to find you. I needed connecting pieces. I needed to build structure. When is this? His response sounded almost guilty like he knew he was disappointing me. Yesterday. Or the day before. Less than a week for sure. A heavy bitterness fell across me. I'm not really talking to you, am I? No. But you did. Recently. These bits and pieces don't come from anywhere. He added one last message as I began falling back into the flood. Don't tell them anything. I wanted to promise that I wouldn't, but I had no idea what he meant. Instead, I clenched my hand harder about the sole, unmoving, solid points of my existence. I didn't know what it was that I held on to, only that I must for as long as I could. The crushing torrent took me once more, and I awoke in three places at once. As I descended from the crest of a rough hill, I regarded the path ahead with hard eyes. An ongoing powder dripped slowly around me, not rain, but a long-awaited melting above, below, and all around. Endemic white trails still clung to every bowl and shadow, awaiting higher angles from the sun. A phone conversation. Several incomprehensible facts and feelings. Had I acquired this fever dream from my month of activities in the Appalachian Mountains, or had it been real? No. 
This was real. This had all happened. Just not necessarily in the order I was experiencing. And so, the true enemy had been revealed. I reached a rocky escarpment and looked down the vast, verdant landscape before me. I could feel it in me, all around me. My heart beat with expectant sharpness, and every breath brought fierce energy. This I could handle. This I knew how to fight, despite the limitless danger I was in. I had to grin. I'd been railing against demons of this particular kind my entire life. I lived this enemy. Somewhere out there, in a not-too-distant city, two other versions of me ran free, following the paths that had been laid out to them by time and memory. They were living what I'd recently lived. I couldn't change what had happened, but I could warn them, stop them, save them from the greatest mistake of our life. Were my intentions foolish? Maybe. But they probably went with the territory. I clenched my fists with excitement and began running down into the world. This was my chance. I looked. I was insane. I was insane and suffocating a tumultuous river of madness that would inevitably drown me. But I finally understood. I jumped up, full of adrenaline, and scanned the dark basement. Eerie, flickering emerald light danced in through small, ground-level windows, illuminating the dusty space with spectral patterns. I saw no threat. Immediately, I checked my backpack, but nothing, human or otherwise, had disturbed the precious contents within. A wave of pulsing pain in my forehead briefly brought me low. My whole body ached with exhaustion and bruises, and I could still feel every sensation of hitting a roof and then arcing to the ground alongside a falling gutter. Yesterday's terrible mishap. I said a momentary prayer for never having to endure that again. Fighting through the pain, I sat up, ready to fight in whatever way needed. Pulling out of the fog of sleep, I'd suddenly remembered the chaos of the previous night. Climbing up against the wall, I peered out to the small high window. A curtain of chill touched my face as the light from burning houses reached me. The emerald flames pulsed cold rather than heat, and they towered toward the sky, ever-burning, unconsuming. Half the suburb here was on fire, cold fire, and yet the houses weren't being charred or destroyed. Instead, continual layers of ice seemed to be building up on them. I could guess at the dangers of icy flames that never went out. Something like that could be a threat to an entire city. Or worse. They hadn't spread far during the night, though, despite the incredible rains that had provided fuel for their ice. Floating balls of orange flame, far more natural, yet frighteningly autonomous, circled the outer edge, tapping it with darting fingers of fire. Were they containing it? Even slowly extinguishing the cold fire? More sentient flames patrolled the streets. Something massive moved somewhere distant, caught only in glimpses between the houses, a massive hulking thing that seemed to be struggling against a swarm of weird black spheres. Far closer, my heart skipped a beat as I saw thin silver filaments lying on lawns, sidewalks, in the street. They glittered in a spectral emerald, shining all the way up toward... Christ... Beyond the dangers, as I got low and close to the window to peer up, I saw the sky rippling with a vivid patchwork of disparate colors. Effulgent red, conflicted with pockmarked yellow, both struggling against the spectral blue. As I watched, other patchwork hues stormed past. Each sky was inherently different in cloud composition and angle of light, all seemed to be in stormy chaos. Reality had come apart while I'd slept. But I'd gone into the forest and into the mountains to help stop this. Feeling strangely sick, I hunched over my backpack. 
Nobody had interfered with it. How had this happened? I wouldn't seem to recall the exact details of what had gone on in the mountains now that I was actively trying to remember. Find out where everyone went. Right. That's what I had to do. Burning with determination, I grabbed my things, slung on my backpack, and crept toward the stairs to the first floor. I miraculously managed to step up each ancient step without making a sound. Slowly turning the handle, I tried not to breathe too loudly. I had absolutely no way of knowing what was out there. The sentinel ball of flame sort of matched the height of a man. It hovered near the fridge, lightly touching pictures on the fridge, or actually the magnets that held them there, and it turned in surprise as it saw me. Or at least the motion it made reminded me of a surprise turn. I bolted for the front door and burst out into blasting hail and snow coming down from towering ice flames. The cold was as bad as a physical punch to the face, but I forced myself through because as I darted a glance behind me, the flames were following. Two came out from beyond the corner of a house ahead. I veered sharply on the frozen street and I fell roughly on my hands and knees. Sliding forward at an alarming pace, looking left and right quickly, I sighted six sentient flames closing in from different directions. How far could they reach? What did they want? I had to assume they were hostile. From the systematic manner in which they were surrounding me and cutting off routes of escape. I felt its presence nearby without the need to look. Instead, I calmly reached over with one hand and down with the other. The silver noose flicked along my hand, up my arm, and straight to my neck, even as I gripped it to brace against the coming jerk. It still shot jagged red through my awareness, but I didn't die instantly. Instead, I brought the wood knife I prepared around and slashed the cord just as I shot up at an angle into a pine tree. I knew what was coming. I'd endured it once before. That didn't make the gut-wrenching fall any easier. Smashing down through a tree, I struggled to catch a major branch before I fell too far. The knife had gone, but I was glad for both hands and the relative softness of evergreen branches. Tumbling and sliding down at a breakneck pace, I hit the ground with both feet in a groan. Twenty feet outside the circle of flames. Get up. I am. I'm not going to sit in here and die. Crawling forward for a moment, I managed to get to my feet and then bolted away a long ground that was increasingly free of ice. The further I got from the towering green flames, the warmer the air grew. And the more energy I found coursing in through my lungs. Four blocks away, and satisfied that the flames had ceased to follow, I finally slowed. There didn't seem to be a single part of me left that didn't hurt. I'd been smashed against a roof, thrown to the ground, slapped down along a pine tree. And I'd been sleeping poorly, eating almost nothing, and running about an empty world for days. I fell to my knees. Get up. I nodded. Clambering back up with a gasp, I pushed forward. I'd seen the base of operations of the men who still maintained the city. It had been a high school before, but now the fences and complex brick buildings served as adequate defenses against the elements and wandering threats. Watching from afar, I studied the place under the chaotic sky. It wasn't being guarded like a military organization might have guarded such a place, but there were still a few men keeping watch on the fences. I could see how uneasy they were with their new sky and randomly terrifying neighbors. The only saving grace of their position, like mine had been in the basement of that house, was that none of these threats knew or cared about their presence. I hadn't been watching for too long when I saw their leader, Jay, pacing the inside of the fence and talking on his cell phone. Moving closer, I began to hear some of his conversation. The advice you gave us? He shouted angrily. I tied up the purple slice, and the thing expanded and busted right open. We almost got killed out there. Two guys didn't make it back. 
He paused as someone on the other end responded. Oh, we were supposed to tie ourselves up when the purple slices of sky came overhead? I must have misunderstood. I'm sorry. He nodded his head sadly as the other spoke. I don't know if we can do this, he finally said. It's gone insane here. He moved away, still talking but out of hearing range. I sat in my hiding spot, jaw set. So, these people had been warned, even instructed. I thought something of the kind when they'd handed out boxes of curiously chosen survival gear, but now I knew for certain. They'd expected this. But who could have warned them? Who was on that phone? Would, would Heath be talking to them on the phone and ignoring me? The flames had been trying to contain the ice flames, as they were actually trying to help out or at least protect themselves, but they chased after me like I was a threat. Was I a threat? What was I doing here? I held my hand on my forehead and clenched my jaw against a random jab of pain. Find out where they went. Right. If I could just find out where they went, everything would work out. I'd fall out into the embrace of humanity again, taken care of by... What? All my friends? I'd long ago pushed away everyone I cared about. I'd often told myself it was for their own protection. At some point, I think I just started enjoying being alone. It was easy. If things got too bad, I could just run. I was always dodging devastation by refusing to care about anything. Why did I even want to find out where everyone had gone? When was the last time I'd even talked to Chris or Caitlin? Why were the only two people I really cared about so distant in my memories? People I'd known growing up. People I'd had no choice but to include in my sense of self. What had Caitlin said to me the last time we'd talked? You can only see people you can use. I swallowed a lump in my throat. Was she right? It had taken me this long to understand what she'd meant, and now there was nobody left to see except those I could use. Running a mental hand over the hills and valleys of my mind, I began to understand that something was very wrong with my find out where they went. Right. I winced against the pain, stood up slowly, and began creeping toward an unguarded portion of the high school grounds. As I drew closer, I saw Roger standing by himself just behind a corner, a lit cigarette in his hand. Rolling awake, I looked around in confusion. Right. Home. In bed. I clambered up and moved to my computer. When was this? Which me was I? Okay. Laptop's here. Hasn't been taken yet. Or was it duplicated? I wrote out an email, even if he wasn't responding. Losing my story structure here, my thoughts, my brain, my life, my grammar. I sat in place, reflecting on why I even wanted to find other aware people. Chris, Caitlin, all the people who might have ever been my friends. I left them all. I could handle anything on my own, right? Typing the words made that admission harder somehow. I bit off more than I can handle alone. I could feel my grip tiring, the exhaustion burning in my arm. The waters of madness had reached a force seemingly beyond enduring. Let's retrace, I told myself. I saw the other me. Where? I saw him out there in the suburbs. I took my car back. I lost him. But I found that trap in the bell tower and... By the time I'd reached home, he was gone, and he'd taken my laptop. Right. I swore the laptop and the email I thought I'd typed were gone. What did I have? I brought my cell phone out to check on it. 
It hadn't been tampered with, but judging by the nightmares roving around outside in the shattered sky, the other me's cell phone had been a copy, and somebody had interacted with it. Had they noticed the sky rending apart moments after messing with it? I doubted they'd have made the connection. Now, who was with the aware survivors? Who had claimed to know me? Oh, wait. No, I didn't know that yet. That had been the other me. I was convinced I could work through insanity if I just linked enough chains of logic. Was that how madness trapped people? By giving them false hope? I shook my head. I had to assume there was a way through this. Slinging on my backpack, I went downstairs and out the front door. A few blank-eyed neighbors were around. One was mowing his lawn, one was washing his car, and one was walking his dog. Wagging his tail happily, the long-haired brown dog pulled his absent master toward me. I held out my hand and he licked it in greeting. You, I told him laughing. You're real. You're making the best of it, I see. He barked once, then moved on, sniffing his way down the sidewalk. It hadn't occurred to me to wonder where I really was, despite the experiences and memories blurring my awareness. A light-hearted dog had wandered between the worlds with ease. I couldn't be somewhere entirely horrible, could I? Not if there was a dog here. Unless I imagined him, of course. I'd been totally convinced it was real, too, without any reason for such a conviction. Was I getting worse? Would I lose all self-analytical ability soon? Why should I fight for sanity anyway? What was I trying to accomplish with my life? I never once softened my grip on my own solitary and bitter behavior. Reality was full of nightmares in the shadows, and I'd sought out those shadows my entire life. I had a one-tracked mind, and I was my own self-fulfilling prophecy. This wasn't about the events that had happened. This was about me, my actions, and how I felt about what I'd done. I suddenly knew where I needed to be. Running along the sidewalk, unclear that eerie, multicolored sky, I chose my destination with fury. I would never make it in time, and I hadn't made it in time, so... I fast-forwarded a bit. It was this house. One unassuming, suburban house among all the others. I'd only known the first time by that strange sense of narrative importance. It had simply popped out. I pushed through the unlocked back door and headed for the basement, even as I heard the screams ringing out. I wasn't too late this time. Heading down the stairs, I covered my mouth and forced down revulsion. The dirt floored and cinder blocked lined room stank of vileness and blood. The other me, the first me, stood over a brutally wounded older man who'd been tied to a chair. Can you not see yourself? I asked, horrified and disgusted. The other me turned slowly, his eyes wide, his features surprised. It's you. You're the one that's been hunting me. I balled my fist in rage. Can you not stand apart from your own emotions and see what you're doing objectively? Roger knows where they went, he responded, desperate. I have to know. I have to find out where they went. The older man spat blood. I'll never tell you, you son of a bitch. You'll have to kill me. And he will, I stated flatly. Don't tell this bastard a thing. The other me dropped the fork he'd been holding. Wait. It didn't happen this way. This is not how things went. We're insane, I countered. How do you know? Because I feel guilty. 
He breathed, staring at his bloodied hands. And your mind is just like mine. You feel guilty too. But we didn't do it yet, I said, rushing over and untying Roger. Get out of here. You two are fucking crazy, he gasped, running up the stairs in pursuit of freedom. My doppelganger stared after him, stunned. He sees two of us? I nodded. I left you in a cave, years ago, to be eaten by some sort of spider creature. God. He breathed, blinking, as he tried to piece together his fragmented reality. That was... me? I thought... He lifted his gaze. Roll one of off-screen deaths. If you don't witness it yourself, they're always coming back. It was a basic rule of writing, and as an author, I should have known. How did you survive? Where had you been all this time? Why are you here? I asked him. What's driving you to... My eyes brimmed as I regarded the blood on the floor and chair. This... This isn't us. I think I'm you, he replied, leaning weakly against the wall. I mean, I am you now, since we're remembering this later. But I'm missing so many memories, and there's a voice in my head urging me on with such strength I just can't resist it. The realization hit me with an almost tangible force. Something sent you. He realized it at the same time. Something used me, edited me, and sent me off into the world to find out where everyone went. What do you mean? I asked, moving toward the stairs to escape the gore. Everyone's still here, they're just passive and unaware, like a disease took their willpower. Is that what you see? He asked. Because I think we only see people we can use. I don't see anybody at all. I see an empty world except for Roger and his colleagues. I frowned and moved while I thought. He followed me upstairs and then out onto the street where we sat under the patchwork sky. I was just thinking about that, I told him, despondent. This world is painfully lonely, but this is how we remember it. This is more or less how our life was anyway. He nodded slowly, his gaze distant. Insanity's the worst. Yeah. I kicked the pavement idly. Even in the throes of madness, I was amazed at how detailed the street was. I could see every little swirl and black shot through the cracks, because that was how madness worked. You saw what you wanted to see, and believed it utterly. As deep as you wanted your examination of something to go, that's how deep you would see. Like a fractal dream. So... What now? he asked. I sat in silence for a time until something occurred to me. Heath said not to tell them anything. Do you think it's not over? Do you think the same unknown force that sent you out with an agenda still has us? It wants to know where everyone went. He stood in shock. The smudge is on our fingers. I stood in shock, about to speak. He cut me off. That's the truth of all this now, isn't it? But keep it to yourself or they'll know. I laughed, marveling at our own breakthrough. In that case, I think I know how to get us out of here. We are going to find out where everyone went. That's the only way. We'll see this thing through to the end. We'll play it out the way it really happened, because we already know where everyone went. We just have to get to that point of the story. His cheeks trembled. If we do that, Roger dies. Because he did die. Is that something you can live with? I didn't say anything. A stormy, technicolor sky roiled overhead, rumbling ominously. I knew that what was about to happen would be very, very bad for the people I hadn't cared enough about that my solitary and bitter choices had brought them untold pain, but their reality was not a malleable mess like mine. 
I could never make out for what had been taken from them. I didn't say anything because I couldn't. All I could do was not. Vast pillars of wood raced by on either side as I kept putting one foot in front of the other. I kept my eyes narrowed as the bare branches overhead orchestrated a maddening pattern of glintling sunlights. Cyan beams crossed crimson glows and a deep purple glowered over my shoulder from behind. Sickly yellow roiled somewhere distant, lurking, watching. I moved through the kaleidoscopic forest with determination, ignoring the visual chaos. How far did I have left to go? And how far behind was I? I'd come later than the other two. Somewhere out there, at that very moment, my doppelganger was torturing Roger to death and my past self was desperately hunting him. He wouldn't find Roger in time because he didn't find Roger in time. And, out in the mountains as I was, I would also be too late. I pushed a little harder and began moving a little faster. The slope steepened, and I'd used the extra kineticism to take longer strides, more ambitious leaps, and more direct shortcuts down the rocky and mossy terrain. Even in the midst of my determination, even with a core of fire burning beneath my heart, my peculiar brain was still calculating. It was rather astounding how real everything was. The trees had bark. The moss had texture. My pounding shoes found purchase on rough stone and soft loam. I had to conclude that this was the realm of the mind, my mind, and I would never be able to convince myself that it was not real through evidence. As deep as I tried to stare at any passing object, I would see exactly what I expected to see and believe that I was seeing what I expected to see. Was that the nature of madness? Was this what other insane people experienced? Realness made purely by mistaken and unshakable belief. But I knew, I knew, how was it possible to have such a schizoid duality of state? To know it's not real, but to be unable to shake that imagined realness. Somewhere distant, somewhere unreal, I was suffocating under a whelming tide of madness, and I could not lift my head to breathe. Thanks to my strange dichotomic state, I had control of me, my own awareness and experience, but nothing more. But in a way, that was everything, wasn't it? Somewhere in my body, I had a kinesthetic sense of the slope beneath my feet as I ran. It felt like a tilted plane, like gravity gone awry, and I gripped that plane within myself. I put a slight testing strength into that grip. The downhill slope didn't change, but it felt steeper, and I began charging forward with greater energy. I tilted that inner plane further, pushed right to the limits of balance and control. I ran almost without effort, my stride becoming more leaping than running. Finding the perfect tilt, I refined my gait until my travel felt like a mad downhill dash. Despite everything else on the line, that feeling was incredible. I'd always enjoyed running, the physical, visceral, alive feel of it all, and this was that beloved feeling pushed to the utmost limit. Hands out, arms up, I reached the crest of a large boulder and leapt in a high, directed arc. For an unknowable span, I felt like I was flying. As with all jumps, it didn't last. I dug my feet into moss and multicolored dirt, and then tilted my inner plane forcibly back until I could physically grip the earth with my hands and come back to a stop. I would reached the edge of the road proper, and a shadow stood waiting for me. At first, it was a shapeless sphere in space, hovering just above the pavement. As I studied it, trying to make sense of what I was seeing, it coalesced into the shape of a man. It didn't seem to like that. It lifted its arms and gazed down at them, its slowly formed shadow, face indignant. Had I done that to it? Had I given it form simply by observing it? It clenched two fists, became a bit more solid, an act of purposeful will. 
and then regarded me with two empty sockets and a dark mask that represented the only variation on the otherwise impenetrable silhouette. I let the go of the ground and stood wary. In my haste, I'd forgotten about the threats the broken sky might bring. Could they still hurt me here? The shadow leapt forward, its mask expanding into a giant maw filled with rows of jagged voids bearing infinite blackness. It went for my right arm, which I flung back in abject surprise, barely saving it from clamping infinite chill. Acting on sheer instinct, I flipped my inner plane hard. The sickening motion sent me into a flying lurch, during which I gained a quick twenty feet from the thing. Quickly fighting dizziness and shock, I grabbed the ground again, righted my inner senses, and stumbled to my feet among clutching vegetation. In my painful aerial tumble, I had crossed over the road entirely. The shadow remained where it stood, masked-faced, human-like again. His dark eyes looked down at the stark line of pavement between us, and then up at me. It spoke in a sibilant whisper that actually seemed to betray a hint of surprised admiration. Fair enough. I stared down at the road and then up at my assailant. The road was a metaphor. I'd done something automatically, instinctively, and closed myself off from being consumed. Of course, it was insane. Everything was a metaphor here. I felt the urge to laugh, but then, under the hungry glare of those empty eyes, I absolutely did not. Instead, I carefully stepped onto the road, making sure to regard it as a path to where I wanted to go rather than the barrier I'd made against the shadowy entity. I didn't want to accidentally undo what I'd somehow done. The shadow stepped onto the road as well, but kept an appreciable distance. I wasn't sure what else to do about it. I stood for a moment, watching the bright, conflicting sunbeams dapple the shadow without effect. Right then, I carefully turned and began running again, this time heading down the road. A look over my shoulder confirmed that the shadow was following. I usually felt emotions from everything around me, like the singing strings of a thousand muted harps, but from this entity I felt nothing at all. That unnerved me more than anything else about it, but it didn't seem to be threatening anymore, and I had to keep going. The road was much easier to run down. I tilted my inner plane again, reaching an even greater speed on a slope that felt very close to straight falling. I remembered what my two previous iterations had felt traveling down this road. One saw nothing, and one saw absent-minded, blank-eyed people without will. The two phantom realities mixed and merged in my awareness, even as I surged straight through them both at breakneck speeds. Quite the conflicted point of view here, the shadow whispered, its words audible in my head despite the roaring wind in my ears. Metaphorical memories, I shouted, arms pumping, feet pushing off pavement to move even faster. In one eye, cars around me appeared to slow as I approached their speed, in the other, the entirely empty road gave me no barriers. But everyone really was gone. The shadow continued to follow, saying nothing. As I began passing nearby cars and their blank-eyed drivers in my scarily steep downhill dash, and as the roar in my ears reached an overwhelming blast, it occurred to me that I was going at at least 70 miles an hour. And why shouldn't I? I was practically leaping down a precipitous infinite loop that shot down into a vat of bright, pooling paints. How strong were my feet? How rough of a leap could I take without injury? Did I really injure myself here? I tilted my inner plane a little further and began spending increasingly longer moments simply arcing intently, nearly straight down. From the outside, I'm sure I would have rather looked impossible, basically flying inches above the ground at a hundred miles an hour. 
But there was no outside, was there? It was only me in here, and I'd experienced this exhilarating and frustrating almost flight countless times in dreams. A surge of experiences and feelings flooded back to me as I recalled my dreams. I'd dreamt about flying so many times. I'd worked at it my entire life, each and every time it occurred to me while I was sleeping. I never managed to actually do it. Thanks to that frustrating limit based on real experiences dreams often give, but I had managed a kind of stressed straight line hovering that I'd often foolishly tried to show off to other people in my dreams. They'd never been impressed. How could they have been? They hadn't even been real. But this... This was very close to that dream-like hovering. All I needed was that feeling of stressed effort off my chest. A kind of held breath, clenched first exertion of will, and the ground didn't fall away. But I didn't come back to meet it either. Holding my fist tight and my heart revved up, I kept myself up with sheer will. All I needed were a few inches to keep from touching the pavement, and the tilted slope did the rest. The forested edges on the road became a blur, and then the lines became seamless. The pavement a surging river. A hundred miles an hour? Two hundred? Three? The mechanics didn't matter. I had somewhere to be. A surge of anger and conviction brought my speed to blurring heights, and I kept my eyes unwavering on my destination. The shadow continued to follow, a subtle blank spot in the feel of the world just behind me. We shot through the world like violent and energetic spear, arcing with fury straight to our target, and then... I was there. The stop was an imagined web of force, reaching out to everything and anything to cushion my sudden deceleration, and a hurricane erupted forward, flattening chain-link fences, shattering high school windows, and knocking several surprised men to flatten the campus grass. Among them was my doppelganger. I stomped angrily forward, pulled him up by the scruff of his weathered collar, and looked him in the eyes. He stared back at me, terrified. He'd had no idea who was hunting him, but he immediately knew the truth as soon as he saw me. Struggling for breath in the still-churning winds of my arrival, Jay clambered up. What? What the hell? This man is lying to you, I shouted, furious. He's already tortured Roger to death in a basement near here, and he's drawn attention to your presence here. But he, he's you. Jay said, confounded, even as the other men started recovering and standing. My terrified doppelganger shook his head. He's lying. He's some sort of trick. There are horrible things coming in from other realities now. Jay stared between us. He did help us avoid a few dangers on the way here. Why would he harm Roger? I glared at all of them. He's trying to figure out where everyone went. The men all froze in place, eyes on me. He's going to use the coming attacks as leverage to try and get at least one of you to talk. And he thinks he's doing it for himself, for the right reasons. I continued. But he's not. He got caught by something and then edited, changed in subtle ways. Used for years, being edited over and over, updated with new memories and new gear and... They didn't send him here to find out where the human race has gone. My doppelganger pushed my clutching fist away and then stared down at his own hands aghast. Is that... true? I knew what he knew because I remembered. His mind was a web of links that didn't make sense. Do you remember G-L-O-R-W-O-C? He shook his head. Do you remember, Mike? He stared at the ground, eyes narrowed and distant. After several heartbeats, an expression of confusion and horror crossed his... my features. 
I I remember a, a mic and he and I encountered it but I, I didn't know what G-L-O-R-W-O-C was when he asked me. He looked up at an older Chinese man among the group and that man took a step back in fear. My doppelganger took a step toward him, begging the answer. How is that possible? I told you, I said quietly, less angry and more dismayed. It edited you. You're an incredible resource for it to use. That's, that's not true. It can't be true. What's in the backpack? I asked him, my expression hard. He wavered. Something important. I, I spent a month in the woods looking for it. Did you? Vaguely following what was happening here, some of the men insisted he open it. Their shouts grew in intensity and tone until he finally relented. Shaking, he slung his pack down and placed it carefully at his feet and then dropped down next to it. Slowly, he opened it and carefully pulled out a laptop, assorted gear, and a few papers. After the last extraneous object was removed, he stared down into the pack, his head shot up, and he gazed at me at a panicked askance. It's radio. I nodded. Everywhere you've gone since you left the woods, everything you've done and everything you've said or heard, someone was listening. A stirring echoed from between the houses across the street from the high school, and I saw our last guest slowly join us. This can't be true. My second version, the real me, the hunter, said loudly, walking up with a surreal expression of horror and confusion. He hadn't heard everything, but he was really just me, so he already knew what had been said. All my fractured selves had finally met up. Who the hell is he? Jay asked, subtly indicating to all his men that they should back away for a few moments on his hand. Oh, that's me. I replied, audibly sad. He's how I experienced this when it really happened. Before the gigantic abomination attacked the sky, ruptured even further. Before you all died. Jay stopped in place. The word came out very quiet. What? I would never do what he's done. My underself said angrily, indicating our doppelganger. I would never give in. I don't care what torture or mind control or anything else some evil thing tried on me. I would never do what he did, Roger. He gave a simple sob, just thinking about the gory scene he'd found. And I would never threaten the lives of all these men. But he did, I replied, looking back and forth between them. He was us, and he succumbed. We are capable of doing what he did, and that's what we feel so guilty about. We're connected. We feel it. Every bit. <laughs> I don't believe it, our doppelganger said, eyes red from brimming sorrow. It can't be real, the hunter said, clutching a fist with righteous sobbing fury. But it is. I told them, my heart heavy. Why do you think we're here? We're insane. And we could be imagining anything, but we're just running through these events over and over. We have to forgive ourselves. But how? The hunter asked, falling to one knee in pain. We screwed up so badly. I got what we were looking for in the forest. I had it on my cell phone, but I, I didn't handle it properly, and the sky shattered. The sky was going to shatter anyway, I told him. You just thought it was your fault at the time. The key program is dangerous, but not that dangerous. It can't crack a wall of reality all by itself. The crushing fist is coming for us, remember? Our doppelganger turned and stared. What did you say? 
I frowned. He should know because I knew, or he couldn't have information I didn't have, could he? Insanity's the worst. I breathed, confusing myself. Yeah, the hunter version of me replied, still staring at each of his duplicates. A deep rumble ran through the ground beneath our feet. I looked west at an approaching triangle of dark orange in the cloudy patchwork sky. We're out of time. Jade ran forward and grabbed my wrist forcefully as another impact shook the earth. Look, I don't pretend to understand what you're arguing about with yourself, but I've got daughters. They're the whole reason I'm still here doing all this. Are you telling me that this world isn't real? A sibilant whisper echoed in my ear. Curious. No, I said after a gulp. I'm sorry. I'm insane. This is all in my head. Is it though? He asked, his fiery gaze locked on my eyes for any sign of doubt. I don't feel imagined. I don't feel like a dream. I shook my head, unable to tell him another no. His gaze intensified. You're telling me. In all this crazy bullshit, sky shattering, living flames floating around, silver nooses in the sky strangling people, a giant spider made of corpses preaching the unholy word, icy green fire, three of you arguing with yourselves. In all that nonsense... There's no chance we're here and alive and real. Another incredible impact sounded closer than the last two. The doppelganger's work had backfired, and he'd attracted something far worse than he'd anticipated. Everyone here was about to expire in their manners most horrible. My face screwed up as I kept shaking my head. I was only able to choke out four words. I saw you die. He gripped my wrist to the point of pain and shoved his face in mine. But you're insane. How would you know? Behind me, the shadow gave a hissing laugh. That thought did stun me. He was right. What the hell did I know? I was mad as a hatter, whatever that meant. Give us a shot, Jay insisted. Get us out of here. I nodded, suddenly feeling odd, numb, neutral, hopeful, traumatized. But there's so much coming. Jay released my wrist. You know what's gonna happen. Steer us away from it. Okay. I breathed, trying to recalculate and reframe everything I thought I'd known. Okay. I looked at my hunter self. You want to do what you came here to do? I stepped forward, towering over our doppelganger. You want to fucking redeem yourself? They both paused, and then at the exact time said quite forcefully, Yes. Then, real or not, we're going to save these people. We're going to avoid the titan that's coming our way. We're going to avoid looking at the raving in-betweens when the sky completely ruptures. And we're going to get these men to... I froze. There was only one place to take them that might truly be safe. We had to get them to wherever the rest of humanity had gone. Right. The point of all this... That was the question, wasn't it? Come on! Jay shouted, trying to be heard over a sudden surging gale forced upon us by the nearby impact of a tremendous beast rolling and writhing its way toward us. I knew where everyone had gone because Jay had told me just before he died, and I'd had it locked away in my mind all this time, somewhere that I wouldn't think about. But the story had led us there, hadn't it? We're going to get these men to the bunkers. I finished telling my other selves. There are giant bunkers in the northern and southern ice caps. There wasn't time to drill them, so they did the next best thing. They melted the tunnels out. The ice hides their energy and heat signatures too, so if something is out there looking for them, perhaps scouring the globe, they'll never find them. Not ever. 
The wind stopped. Jay relaxed, even smiled. Thanks. The men behind him vanished. The high school vanished. My hunter self flickered into me and I suddenly felt strangely more complete. My doppelganger looked up at me in confusion and then slumped. The world became a mess of floating colors. I waited for several heartbeats, stunned but not at all surprised. Alright then, the shadow whispered in my ear. Now that the undue influence is gone, I can go about completing the deal. The deal? I asked, fighting nausea at the technicolor sea invading my senses. Specific biological organisms asked me to find you in exchange for certain things. That's none of your concern at this time. I couldn't clear your perceptions until the Ukva was over. Heath sent you? Yes, that was the verbal designation of one of the specific biological organisms, and I find it quite sadistic that none of you have told it of its true state. There, again, was that hint of admiration in its tone. Quite sadistic, indeed. I swallowed down bitterness. I tried to tell him, all right, but it had only hurt and scared him. If Heath sent you, then why did you try to eat me? The shadow laughed, and its mocking face appeared in my vision, blocking out the colors. Like you, Gwalian. Certain things are just in my nature. Do the others know what you are? I narrowed my eyes. Heath had said this creature delighted in statistic confusion. Do you know what you are? It grew serious for a moment. No matter. You will awaken shortly next to a variety of biological organisms, including a near-exact copy of you. A semi-biological entity is somewhere nearby in physical space. I'm supposed to inform you that it will help you escape. Thanks, I said, feeling sicker the more it spoke. Are you sure you don't want to be consumed? Last chance. Really? No. So be it. It leapt at me thrusting me down into the darkness, and then I found myself in a raging river. Torrents of madness pulled at me with force beyond comprehension. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't lift my head. I was suffocating all over again. And then chilly shadows were tugging at my shoulders, dragging me up and onto the single thing I'd been holding on to, the single point of sanity that had kept me from coming apart completely, the single point that helped me weather the storm. I could care about people. That was it. I could care about people. I'd had the secret, the hidden path humanity had taken to safety, and I'd protected it even at the cost of myself. Caitlin was wrong. I wasn't a terrible person, or at least I wasn't irredeemable. I opened my eyes. White walls. A table. A round wooden table sat before me, covered in papers. The papers covered in writings. Uh, my writings. I picked up one of them. There's something beautiful about raw nature. It existed before you did, and it'll exist after you're gone. It's wide open space with all the vastness of galactic clusters and long dead stars that still shine and its tangled closeness rife with fractically expansive life of every sort that grows into and upon itself with ravenous earnest. I'd been writing it all out. I was a writer. Writing was what I did. That's what they'd been counting on, to find out humanity's secret. The universe as my fractured selves had perceived it had been entirely textual. I still had the smudges on my fingers. Others sat around the table with me, also writing, their eyes blank, their faces expressionless. God, I'd been trying to tell myself. I could feel the effect of the drugs in my system dissipating as the shadow entity's efforts restored my senses. Jay, I whispered. 
He kept writing, his eyes blank. Next to him sat a kid I'd run into at McDonald's, in my mind. Asked him sat Roger. I held my breath to keep from shouting happily. It occurred to me that someone might be around. Carefully keeping my head still, I glanced around the room. There were no security guards or threatening figures in the immediate vicinity, but I suppose why would there be? We were all metaphorical zombies, busy building written realities together that would slowly expose all of our innermost secrets. And I'd just given our captors a big one, too. Were they off to the polar ice caps, even as I looked around the room? Idiots. I reached out and touched Jay lightly, and that touch seemed to spark a little bit of shadow between us. His eyes cleared. Was the shadow purposely helping more than I'd expected? Or was it difficult for it to tell us apart? With whispered instructions, I had each of the men at the table briefly hold hands until all of us began waking up. All of us. Including one man who looked just like me. He looked at me with dismay. His torture and betrayal hadn't been real, but he hadn't known that. He also hadn't known what he really was. Not until I told him. He walked out of that room in a dazed cloud of confused stares and pained exclamations. The building was empty. Had they simply gotten what they needed and left us all to starve? There was no clue who they'd been. The maze-like and empty building was almost immediately recognizable. They'd trapped and drugged us in the very high school Jay and his men had been using as a base of operations. I kept all the papers, intent on writing them up on the computer and posting them for Heath to read. I also spared a moment to consider what might have done this to all of us. Had it been people, other sentient beings, or a creature, an entity of some sort? It was impossible to know. Outside, the sky remained a shattered patchwork filled with rolling multicolored clouds. My doppelganger sat down on a curb and stared at the parking lot, his thoughts likely in turmoil. What now? Jay asked, studying himself for injuries. He found none and looked around at his colleagues happily. Can we go home? I shook my head. No. What? Why not? Isn't it obvious? I asked. We can never be sure if we're out. If I was whoever did this to us, I would try at least one trick escape. This can all be a ruse. We think it's over, so we give them what they want, like fools. That brought wide eyes and horrified expressions from the entire group. We can never talk about it, I said, sitting down on a curb and staring absently at the parking lot. We can never think about them, never go find them. He's right, my doppelganger called out. I hate being us sometimes. Isn't there any hope? A thin, older man from the group asked. I shrugged. If someone or something comes along and takes us there, then we'll know we're really out because whoever had us captive can't fake what they don't know. So there's a chance. It just can't come for us. What about us? An unfamiliar voice asked. We all looked over in unison. A teenage boy of about 18 or 19 stood by the chain link fence. Behind him, a jagged oval in space wavered, its edges ethereal cyan. Inside that oval and beyond it lay the exact same suburban street, but under a clear blue sky. The boy peered at us. Y'all wanna go? This place looks rough. One thing, though, we're going to need your help. With what? Jay asked, stepping forward. It didn't surprise me. He'd already volunteered once. Volunteered to stay behind a man in an empty world on the off chance humanity might return. This was the kind of man that did what was needed. See, the kind of man I should try to be, since 
I could make choices that weren't lonely and selfish. I could actually care about people. A strange shadow that had been following me my whole life had somehow, during my trial of insanity, been lifted. It had left with that other shadow, the grinning and hungry one, and not a trace of either remained. I was a human being, just like everyone else, and I could care. The thought brought inexplicable tears to my eyes. The boy grinned with excitement. It'll be tough, but it'll be awesome. We found her, and we're going to do the mother of all prison breaks. Jay went to reply, but I beat him to it. I stood up abruptly, leaving the curb and the sidelines behind. Yes, we'll help. 